clerk? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none. Thank you. A motion to confirm that the agenda for the special council meeting of December 10th, 2020 be approved as presented. Moved by Councillor Howley, seconded by Councillor Timpson. All in favor? Carried. Declarations of pecuniary interest. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I have none. Thank you. So we're into delegations and as I understand it, uh, the treasurer, Carly Collins, will be uh, presenting the first draft of the uh, 21, 2021 budget. And treasurer, I know this is your, your first uh, presentation of a budget as, as treasurer. Um, I can assure you that, and, and all the staff that uh, if there are any comments or questions or raised eyebrows, they're not about you as, as staff or presenters, they're about the dollar signs. So don't take anything personally, it's, it's all about the money. Um, and treasurer people are looking forward to it and, and looking forward to your, your success at doing it. So just relax and let's get the show on the road. Okay, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, the management team would like to present to you the 2021 uh, budget draft number one. And just, there might be a couple of glitches. That's all right. You're going to share a screen, are you? Yeah, Brian. Okay. I It won't allow me to share a screen. You're on mute. One moment. So as we go through, it could be there'll be a. Uh, we'll be looking at a at a screen of of numbers, uh, council. So. When it comes time for questions, I'll probably do the, do the roll call rather than look for waved hands. So I'll just go around the table and give everybody their chances. Uh, so I see uh, Councillor Fennell has joined us. And Carly, if you want to try again to share your screen, I think I've made the adjustments. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Councillor Fennell. We're just underway. And if you're not uh, talking, uh, remember to go on mute. Uh, thank you, everybody. So tonight's presentation is broken down into three different areas. We have the first area, which is the operating budget. So the management team will be discussing the 2021 operating budget, along with a presentation from the library in regards to their operating budget. The next session will be about capital and reserve budgets. From there, the management team will be discussing their 2020 capital projects brought forward, along with anything new that is being requested for the 2021 budget year, along with all the transfers from in and out of the reserves and the reserve funds. Part three for the data analysis, we'll be going through funding requests. So this is any donation requests that have come outside uh, from the public that are requesting it to be added to the 2021 budget. Along with what the taxation increase request is coming from the management team to council for approval. The first section, I will be handing it over to the CAO and we'll be discussing some of the 2020 recaps of what has occurred uh, within our municipality this year. Thank you, Carly. Through you, Mayor uh, Lawrence. So uh, we, we undertook a number of studies and uh, various um, uh, consulting uh, reports this year. So just to highlight the major ones that were done, uh, the Organizational Municipal Services Delivery Review, that is, uh, is almost finalized now. It's going to council next week in a special council meeting, I believe on December 15th. We uh, underwent the sports tourism strategy, which was already presented to council. The economic development strategy review as well was uh, presented and done. Uh, municipal strategic plan for the next five years, 2020 to 2025. Uh, we underwent building con condition assessments uh, on all of our buildings for our asset management plan. 
uh, through the Development Services Department. And the airport master plan was uh, initiated this year and is almost uh, completed and will be presented to council in the near future. A little highlight on COVID-19. Um, as everybody knows, every, uh, everything slowed down because of COVID-19, but it actually created quite a bit of work, uh, extra work for a lot of, uh, of our staff uh, in the municipality, as well as anybody else, any other agencies and businesses as well to have to deal with the challenges that COVID presented itself. Um, so we dedicated a page on the website specifically to COVID related updates to, uh, to the public and any information regarding our own facility operations uh, within the municipality. We initiated the health and safety uh, committee again this year. Um, and in doing that, we also made health and safety adjustments to all the buildings to deal with COVID. So that consisted of um, implementing, you know, extra sanitation, uh, changing the way we're doing things on the job, especially for the public works department out in the field in our, our facility uh, staff and also the physical adjustments to putting some walls up to create um, a type of barrier so that the offices aren't as open uh, to the public to go to walk freely as normally did under normal circumstances. And um, the economic development department also took on small business and tourism sector, sector targeted support. So our economic development manager, Vicki Blanchard also uh, provided COVID related updates, funding opportunities, strategies and she continues to work with the small businesses and tourism sector in the municipality. Thank you. Under communications, we initiated a municipal newsletter this year. The economic development department also put, started putting out uh, monthly newsletters. We have done a number of media releases this year on various uh, projects and in particular with uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And we enhanced our customer service request portal on our website for people to um, submit their requests and or complaints to the municipality. More, some of the bigger projects that we've taken on this year, of course, is the Far Farlinger Park uh, waterfront development. Uh, it's due to be substantially complete uh, in February of 2021, slightly behind schedule uh, because of COVID-19 uh, issues. But uh, as everybody can see, uh, the building should be going up uh, shortly in the near future. So it's exciting to see that project come to uh, fruition. Uh, the Wellington, Wellington and First uh, Street uh, intersection design was done for the um, uh, reconfiguration of that intersection. About four kilometers of resurfacing was done on our rural roads this year. We had efforts to secure housing and development and that involves uh, some projects that are very, very close to coming to fruition to uh, on the cusp of, of being announced. And that is the Hillcrest development and the Big Book development. So we're excited about that as well. And we're also working with um, other uh, agencies and investors on the rapid housing initiative as well. So those things, although they're not complete yet, a lot of time and effort has gone into those projects by our various managers in, in our departments. The wastewater treatment plant uh, UV upgrades uh, were done and I believe they're in the commissioning stage right now. They should be finalized. Uh, the commissioning should be finalized by the end of the month because it has to be done according to regulated uh, timelines uh, to have it in. Uh, we reinstituted our health and safety committee. Uh, the Valard Base Camp uh, was also uh, up and running in a short period of time, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, uh, coordinated effort on uh, their part and mostly on our, our management team's part in, in getting the site ready. Uh, the roofing on the fire hall uh, in Hudson was done. The kitchen roof at the fire hall was also redone and, and uh, refurbished. Uh, the flushing truck uh, building roof at the public works yard too was also done. Uh, the roof was redone. Uh, the, we rebuilt the uh, library retaining wall that had collapsed, uh, renovated the men's sauna in the fitness center. Unfortunately, it got renovated and then we had to close due to COVID. So nobody was able to enjoy it, but they will when we reopen. And uh, electrical upgrades were done at Centennial Park and we refurbished a number of the town beach uh, dock sections. 
so those are the main highlights of what uh, types of projects that took place this year. So it was a fairly uh, busy and robust year, even with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic affecting us. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Now we'll be going on into our operating budget. Each manager will be presenting their operating budget to council. One thing that um, I just want to stress to council prior to us going into that is if, is if council sees any wages and benefits increase within the operating budget, in particular benefits, this is a mandatory employment related cost that is uncontrolled by the municipality. And the one thing that we did notice this year going into 2021 is that EI, CPP, WSIB, Manulife, OMERS have all gone up um, dramatically, which has a huge impact on our operating budget for certain areas. So if you see that, uh, I just wanna make council aware of this prior to us going into each department's um, budget. So that going forward, airport is the first department. So I will bring on the airport manager to discuss how he put together his 2021 budget and um, how it has, COVID has impacted uh, the airport. Good evening, can you hear me? Anybody? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, well, yes. no, because I, I was all excited. I got this fancy new monitor with video and camera and everything, and it worked in the test, and I just tried it again, and it, I can see me in the test, but for whatever reason, Zoom doesn't like me. But that's, that's it. Here we are. So I still look the same, probably just a little more uh, weary. That's about it. Anyway, uh, airport, uh, airport budget, very, very challenging, um, trying to compile a positive outlook, if you will. Uh, the aviation industry across the country um, is in uh, dire straits. Um, so uh, taking a uh, somewhat um, positive outlook on uh, the going forward in, in the COVID times that we're in, is we uh, turned around and took six months of current uh, levels, basically COVID-19 levels as to where we're at today, and then brought back 2019 numbers um, for six months uh, for the remainder of the budget year. Now, that being said, um, it's a wee bit aggressive um, but we don't want to be overly uh, doom and gloom with no positive outlook. Uh, and I only say that because currently in the, in the industry, we're looking at about a two to four year recovery. Um, but with Silico, the way we're positioned um, and what we do and who we service, it should recover a little quicker, uh, depending on what happens now going forward in, with, the, uh, with the virus. So that being said, um, we, we also turned and had a really good look at uh, at our expenses. As you know, full know that in through 2020 and from the onset of COVID, uh, a lot of spending uh, came to a halt. A lot of capital spending was put on hold, uh, and any spending we could push out, we did. Unfortunately, there are regulatory requirements and operating costs that uh, don't go away. So that. That has to obviously take into consideration, even though our revenues have, have decreased dramatically, uh, our day-to-day -day expenses uh, are remain the same. And in some areas have increased both naturally and due to COVID-19. So uh, that being said, at the end of the day, based on our, our, our approach on the budget, it's still going to leave us in a deficit of over six hundred thousand dollars at the end of 2021, if all goes well according to plan. Um, obviously, the major loss in that is is landing fees, facility fees, parking, aviation fuel sales. It, it all it all snowballs and goes hand in hand once you lose the activity at the airport because planes in, planes out, passengers in, passengers out. That's our business, right? The good news is uh, in regard to this, 
And another reason why taking staying positive, more positive than negative, is the fact that our tenants are surviving. Uh, to date, we're doing okay. They're doing, they're around, they're surviving. Uh, so that's helping as well, because that revenue, we haven't lost revenue in, uh, in lease. Um, so that's, that's helping. So that being said, we just have to keep an eye and be prudent. Um, it's not that we never keep an eye on the budget, but it's a far more stringent and eagle eye, if you will, now going forward, because if the trends don't start to move kind of as expected, if you will, or across the industry as being projected at the moment, uh, we'll have to take uh, different measures uh, quicker uh, this time around, now that we know we're dealing full with, with COVID. So um, I'll leave it at that and just ask if there's any questions. Is, um, ben, is there just the one slide that you're showing? That's the whole, I, yep, that's it. That's the whole deal. Okay. I'll, I'll go around the council table uh, and ask for questions, but uh, your questions may come at, at more at the, the next meeting than this one, uh, given the length of time that uh, uh, staff have had with, with the budget. But uh, let's go around. Uh, Councillor Howie. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation, Ben, and I'm glad that you're optimistic um, and avoiding the doom and gloom for the for the airport. Um, the only thing that I, I wanted to to ask, and um, this is my my first budget, just like the treasurer, but um, their contracted services are listed at about fifty seven thousand dollars. Could you just can I give a brief overview of what kind of things we contract out at the airport? Um, Okay, absolutely. But can you tell me, is that the total or what portion of the budget? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm under administration um, expenditure, you have contracted services listed. It's the same as 2020. Yeah, so contracted services there, that's our safety management. Uh, that's our safety management system. We contracted out the uh, safety management administration. Uh, it was far more cost effective to do that, it, it basically consumes a full-time position in, in normal operations. So we, we went that route back, I think we started that in November of 2019, I do believe. Okay, thank you. That's it, Councillor Howie for now, yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Timpson. Thanks, uh, Ben. Um, I was just uh, thank goodness for operating reserves. Um, I noticed that we will have a million left. Is that going to be okay? Will that suffice for predicted uh, needs next year? Do you think? Um, to you, Mayor Lawrence. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor Simpson. Simpson, we can we can certainly um, we can hold the fort right now on reserves, but we have to be very, very cautious. Something is gonna, it's something has to give over the next 12 months uh, on the positive side in order for us to carry on and not, yeah, I'll just leave it at that because I want to stay on that positive, on that positive side. But we'll be okay for 2020, 21. So, because don't forget some of that, some of that reserve will have to be used to offset 2020 losses as well. Thank Thank you. Councillor Bath. Uh, hi, Ben. Thanks for being positive. I didn't expect anything else. Um, the, uh, the only question I had was uh, where, where are we now in percentage of operating uh, percentage of aircraft, I guess? I know we were down to something like 20% earlier on in the year. And I'm, where are we now? Okay, so yeah, absolutely. The, with the big onset of COVID, um, we were operating at about an 80% loss. Uh, then as, you know, things changed and there started to be the reopening started to happen. Uh, we peaked at about 50% of our operating, and it it 
it's not consistent anymore because there's certain charters and other activities that come through due to COVID in the fight, such as nursing charters and stuff like that. Um, so we've kind of averaged it out that we're basically operating at a 70% loss at the moment. And that's what we projected going into 2021. We, we, it's a happy medium. Um, you know, some days are better than others. And as you know, some are a little quieter than others as well. So that's about the, uh, that's a safe, that's a safe average to use right now is operating at a 70% loss. Okay, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Fenland. Uh, the other thing I got is a question about um, the property on the east side of the airport, that there's been money set aside for clearing that up. It's all slashed down, but it's not, it looks like a really bad fire hazard for that end of the airport. Uh, through you, Mary Lars, the east side, like which end, like the southeast end? Yes, the Buchanan land property that was brushed off there. Oh, between between Morgan Fuels and, and the runway, that, that yeah. area there? Yeah. Yeah, the last discussion with the harvester, it's in, it's in the harvester is uh, between now and the end of December. Uh, the remaining wood is to be taken from that area and the slash, either the rest, the remaining is supposed to be bundled up in the slash piles, uh, obviously for burning or chip and spread on the property. Okay. That's all I got. The budget is what the budget's going to be, I guess, for the airport anyway. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, I have nothing, uh, nothing more to add. Just uh, thank you, Ben. I know, I know this is a challenging one for you, so I appreciate the uh, the overview of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lego. Uh, yeah, this question is for either the CAO or the treasurer. Uh, and thank you, Ben, for all your hard work. Much appreciated. Um, where are, or has there been any word on the second round of COVID funding? Um, so we can cover some of these loss, losses at the airport. At this time, nothing has been presented yet to municipalities. When we did submit, we were told that municipalities would hear by the end of the year. So I'm hoping to hear before Christmas um what exactly is going to come out of um our phase two application that we submitted thank you thank you and, and my question was was similar just to follow up on councillor legos um <clears throat> have municipalities with municipally owned airports uh has there been a sort of a coalition or or is there joint lobbying advocacy for, for funding, Ben? Special funding for, for impacted airports? Yeah, three of our arts, absolutely. Uh, the airport groups have been quite strong in that. And in particular, uh, RCAC, the Regional Community Airports of Canada, uh, we, they actually employed uh, a consultant group to compile all the information from the small airports across the country in, in regard to that in municipally owned and operated and presented that and sent that um, to 144 ministers and delegates. Um, it kind of fell on deaf ears. Um, and I only say that because that advocacy and the follow up with the Minister of Finance, and this is at the federal level in October, uh, nothing yet has come to light and, and we're really trying to get the point across is the fact that municipally owned and operated airports, because of the governance models, they don't meet the criteria for any of the funding, whether it be uh, wage, the wage subsidies or, or any of it. And when they come across and speak to rent relief, that is only for the large, uh, the NES airports with the national airport system that, that that are, are benefiting from that. And those are the only ones that really pay rent to the federal government. So we've come just recently come to the conclusion basically is, is um, 
we've got to find if anyone is going to help us financially, it doesn't seem to be the federal government. They seem to have just, um, uh, they just, I, with, without being, without trying to sound facetious, they just don't seem to care about the small regional airports across the country that feed the big guys. And uh, what about the province? Will they take on any role? Well, that's that's our next step. Um, that's our next step is to, uh, well, I guess without giving anything really away, there'll be a report coming to council at the regular council meeting that's going to speak directly to that and what the next steps for us may be. And is that and that's to start from the ground up, as opposing to start at the regulator uh, regulator down. As far as the feds down, we're going to start from the municipality up. And with, with that, in the hopes of maybe getting something out of the problem. The, the airports uh, in all the Northern First Nations are operated by the Provincial Minister of Transportation? They're, they're operated by, owned by the federal government, operated by the province, correct. So there is a tie in there with the province. Well, um, uh, look forward to seeing what you can do, and obviously, Council would. Uh, would assist if we can in advocacy uh, for our airport. Thanks, uh, Airport Manager Ben. Is there anything else, Council? I can see a few. Just to speak up if you have any anything else. Hearing nothing, I'll take it. Say thank you, Ben. Is that the end of your presentation? Uh, that's all I've got. Unless there's any more questions, it sounds like there's none. So thank you. Well, very there, much. there might be some. Uh, um, after the, in in the coming uh, week or two, uh, as council councillors review the the documents. Well, Thanks, I wouldn't ben. be I wouldn't be surprised if there's some by the end of this meeting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> treasurer, back to you. Thank you, Ben. Now we go on to bylaw and emergency services which will be presented by the fire chief. Hello, um, through you, Mayor, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, um, this will be my first uh, budget meeting, so I hope I'm doing it all right. So if there's anything that you need to correct, let me know. Um, so this is the budget here, like you can see it in the, in your uh, overall budget, uh, the biggest difference is that there are variations in the budget would be the, in the bylaw would be in the salaries. There's a reduction there. And in the emergency services portion, there's an increase of uh, 14,600. And that's mainly related to the travel and training for the firefighters, both in Hudson and in Sioux Lookout. And that is the end of my presentation. Does council have any questions in regards to the increase that happened within the emergency services? My apologies. I, I went on mute and then I was wondering why Councillor Howie wasn't responding. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Howie, I'll go around the table. Um, yeah, th thank you, uh, Chief, for your presentation. Um, uh, uh, the only question I had was um, you, you were very thorough in your breakdown of the budget between um, bylaw, animal control, uh, parking tickets. Um, could you just outline a little bit the breakdown like of staff time for wages and benefits across? I see like it's $15,000 under uh, animal control, and then with bylaw, it's about $125,000 and, and just for like time commitment for staff wise. Um, I know there's a new uh, part time admin assistant within the department and, and that role is getting going. Um, through you, Mary Lawrence. There isn't uh, the budgets like as in that uh, is a uh, treasurer mentioned that it's it's a defined uh, cost there is there's no uh, commitment on our end how we how we uh, increase or decrease that um, perhaps the treasurer can further explain on that but 
Um, there is under the by under the bylaw animal control. There's a portion of that component that goes towards uh, the bylaw bylaw enforcement officer, and then there's a portion of that that goes through the, the bylaw and then parking tickets, and then and there's also a portion of my salary that would be fit into all three of those as well as part as and as well as the emergency services portion. Robert, I can ex explain the percentages of how we budget for those different areas, if you like. Okay. So what we do with the fire chief in regards to his wages, his wages is broken out. 50% of it is uh, placed into emergency services and 50% of it is placed in uh, to bylaw. In regards to our bylaw officer, we have 12% that's placed into uh, parking patrol. We have 67% um, then is placed into uh, bylaw. We also have the half time for the admin. Uh, same thing with uh, that individual. That individual is broken out 50-50 between emergency services and bylaw. And that's just an estimate as to how much time we feel that those particular positions uh, fall within those areas of the budget. Sometimes when it comes to actuals, there may be more within emergency services and less within bylaw, but in the end, it all balances out. All right, Councillor Howie. Yeah, thank you. I was just seeking some clarification on that breakdown. But, uh, no, thank good. you for that, Treasurer. Thank, Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, thank you. I don't. I don't know if that was a question I was wanting to ask uh, to the Treasurer or to uh, Fire Chief. Why the wages and benefits went down in bylaw, and are we doing emergency services at the same time as this? So the first question is why the decrease in. Um, wages for bylaw uh through you mayor lawrence said so i'll leave that with carly to answer she probably has better knowledge on that so in regards to wages if you do see within this department that there is a slight change or a decrease in wages and benefits it's due to staff changes we've had some staff that has changed within that department so therefore the wages have changed as well That answers that question, Councillor Timpson. Yeah, like staff changes, retirements, and that sort of thing. That is correct. Okay. Okay, that's that was my only question. Are we doing emergency services as well, or just bylaw? You can ask about emergency services as well. Okay, yeah, so there was an increase of 14,000 that, and I think that uh, was training. Um, what particular kind of training would that be? Can uh, somebody elaborate a bit? Sure, through you, Mayor Lawrence. It's a training for the, the firefighters. Um, when we specifically would be, if they're, they're leaving the, the area, there is a training that happens in the Thunder Bay uh, that didn't happen this year, but there's the biggest training component that that's going to consume most of that budget would be the driver uh, DZ training that's required. And then we have to hire an outside co contractor for that portion. And it's, uh, there's several new firefighters that need the DZ to be able to drive the, the vehicles that we have here, the uh, fire emergency apparatuses, they require a special license to drive. So as part of the um, the new firefighters, they they take part in that training. So it's that's the major component of that training dollars. Yeah, and wasn't there also some a few years ago there was a, a mandate came out that that uh, increased the standards for training for all firefighters. Was there not? Is, would that be part part of the reason for this increase? Um, no. That was rescinded when uh, switched over from the liberal to conservative governments. They took that away. That was tabled and it was taken away from the um, that process. So we don't. They, that never went through. 
but we are still doing our part to try to meet that standard through our regular training. But yeah, that there's no, that's not part of it. And with COVID, um, a lot of the training that would have been available to firefighters would have had to happen in the Southern area, like in Ravenhurst, they have a big training college there. So there was a big cost to be able to send firefighters or whoever else wants to expand their, their skills. But now with COVID, they're pushing all that online. So there's a lot of training available to us with no cost from the fire college, as well as no cost for travel. So other than the cost for wages for the firefighters, so which is a significant uh, in, um, bonus to us because of the COVID. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bath. Yeah, thanks, Robert. I don't think I have any questions. I think it's all been asked. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fenlon. No, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, nothing more to add. Thank you, Robert. Councillor Lego. Yeah, just uh, carry on with uh, the training. So the 14,600 is for training only. And is this training mandatory? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes, it's, it's a requirement to be able to drive the trucks. So it's a mandatory training. Okay, so the mandatory training is just for the DZ license then? DZ and if there's any other uh, training opportunities for the firefighters, which is would be like training props and, and internal training. And if okay. required, there's other training that through fire colleges. Perfect. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Councillor. I have no further questions. Uh, anything else, uh, uh, fire, fire Chief? No, that's it. All right, thank you very much. And uh, as per others, be prepared for questions that might come your way uh, later through through the whatever channel that uh, staff says. Um, back to you, Treasurer. Thank you, Robert. Next, we now go to corporate services. So, so corporate services include cemeteries, clerk, and information and technology. And I'll hand it over to the clerk manager. Thanks, Carly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks uh, for the opportunity to uh, uh, to provide an update on the uh, the corporate services department budget. Um, we'll uh, highlight a few things this evening um, uh, that sort of uh, focus on some of the key variances uh, from last year to this year. Uh, so um, I'll I'll go through sort of the increased costs and then where we found savings. Um, so um, with respect to uh, contracted services, um, so within the legislative contracted services, um, you'll recall that we have purchased a new meeting management system. And um, so last year, the cost for that was absorbed through the, uh, the purchase and initial launch. And so this is the, uh, the cost going forward, um, which again is substantially lower than the, the previous system that we, that we had used. Um, additionally, contracted services for photocopying uh, has increased this year, um, and uh, the reason for that is because last year we had brought all the uh, photocopiers, their leases, and so on under the corporate services umbrella uh, as a way to, uh, to achieve a, a number of efficiencies and to save some money. Uh, and what we found is that uh, going forward, we will, uh, we will achieve further efficiencies if we also uh, include the per copy cost uh, for all the various uh, uh, copies that are made uh, in the various departments. And we, so we'll be including that under uh, photocopying as well in, in uh, 2021. So there was an increase there. Um, of, of course, an offsetting decrease in all the other departments who no longer uh, have to absorb that cost. Um, in terms of contracted services uh, with respect to communications, um, the, uh, the costs there are sort of split between um, two, two items. Um, one is uh, related to the required purchase of uh, trail cams and related um, 
the software, hardware, and contracts. Um, there have been um, numerous acts of vandalism in, in certain areas, uh, certain sensitive areas of the municipality um, that we can't use traditional video surveillance uh, equipment for. So trail cams are our only option. Um, and uh, so the hope is that by installing these trail cams, they'll serve two purposes. One, uh, as a deterrent, uh, uh, to potential um, um, vandalism, uh, but also if vandalism does occur, we'll have a much better opportunity to uh, uh, to identify the culprits and, and potentially seek some form of restitution. Um, uh, the communications line itself has increased um, uh, by uh, 5,500, um, and uh, that's to uh, undertake a couple of uh, much needed projects in, in 2021. Um, so that uh, uh, that is is in there. And finally, municipal messages have increased um, to reflect both the annual infl inflationary increased advertising, uh, but also in recognition that since the onset of COVID-19, uh, we've been doing a lot more communication to the public, um, including through municipal messages. Uh, and we foresee that continuing uh, at least through the first part of, uh, of 2021 and, and perhaps for the whole year. In terms of uh, uh, cost savings, um, the uh, the travel and training um, uh, budget for the department has been uh, reduced by um, um, about uh, two thirds. Um, uh, additionally, uh, postage and courier, which is corporate-wide postage and courier, um, has been reduced significantly as we uh, we will be working with the finance department on rolling out um, an opportunity for certain people to uh, subscribe to an online platform that would enable them to view their bills that way and to receive their bills electronically, which uh, in turn would offset the, co the cost of postage. Um, memberships and subscriptions have been reduced in the corporate services department. We've uh, eliminated uh, a number of subscriptions to uh, AMCTO, uh, which is a professional association for, uh, for folks in the municipal sector uh, for a number of the staff uh, as a cost saving measure. And uh, the other significant uh, cost saving measure is that uh, major reduction in equipment purchase for 2021. Uh, there was a one time purchase that was required in 2020. Uh, that's been completed. And uh, so now, um, obviously, that money won't be required next year. Uh, with respect to the cemetery's budget, uh, you'll note that there's uh, an, a net decrease of 20, approximately $2,500 uh, over last year. And finally, with respect to IT, uh, there have been some increases uh, with respect to um, uh, computer hardware and software. Um, we did a, uh, again, uh, IT services are provided through the corporate services department for the entire corporation, uh, for all the departments. So um, when, uh, when we did a review of what would be required from the various departments for 2021, uh, that's how, those, uh, how we arrived at those figures and why there are some, uh, some increases. Um, we did, uh, at the same time, though, um, uh, reduce significantly the, our IT contracted services. So uh, there's been a significant reduction there. Um, and overall, uh, the IT budget is only $66 more in 2021 than it was in, in 2020. Um, so those are the highlights. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions Council may have. Thank you, Clerk. I'll go around uh, starting with uh, Councillor Howie. Thank you, uh, Clerk, for your presentation. Um, if you could uh, adjust the under uh, contracted services again under the cemetery, um, item, what kind of services do we contract out uh, in our cemetery? So contracted services um, in the cemetery are uh, all related to uh, internal transfers. Um, as you can appreciate, the clerk's department doesn't have backhoes and so on. So all that work is completed by public works. But because the uh, cemetery department is a, a revenue generating department in terms of uh, what we charge to the public, uh, there are internal transfers um, to ensure that uh, uh, the general tax base isn't paying for uh, individuals' uh, internments. Okay, thank you. And uh, under the information uh, and technology uh, component of the budget, there is uh, the wages and then there's also the contracted services and those that contracted services uh, figure, I I'm assuming, was developed from the analysis of the demand through the municipality for 2021. That's exactly that correct. Correction? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. 
Just again, Brian, would, could you just repeat what is the biggest, or rather the, 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 ma the major um, factor in the increase? If you wouldn't mind just uh, going over that again, the major factor. Uh, is it certainly, the, for uh, which budget? Uh, cemetery, uh, clerk, uh, the, or IT? The, uh, the clerk budget, yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. So the, the major increase there actually uh, is, uh, is between um, uh, the annual wage adjustment um, uh, for, uh, for the various employees um, and uh, the other um, the other increases uh, are, are sort of smaller in nature um, and incremental. So um, I think I highlighted most of the uh, the uh, the areas that that we're having in increases in terms of contracted services, um, uh, municipal messages, communications, um, and photocopying. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Bath. Oh, yeah, just a, a quick question, Brian. It's on the uh, some of the publications we get, in particular in municipal world. Is there a way to get that electronically rather than hard copy? It seems to me we it's a pretty expensive magazine, and I, I certainly think we could handle if we got that electronically. So the uh, the subscription that uh, that we did uh, for that uh, was uh, was in the first year of, of the term of council, and we did a four year subscription. So we actually saved. Um, um, close to 40 percent um, off the list price um, and by going with the program that we have we get a lot of other incentives like we're able to advertise all of our jobs on their website at no cost um, so there's a number of benefits um, um, that go with uh, sort of purchasing the bundle if you will um, i did look at uh, at the electronic the cost for electronic only and um uh, you're right. Um, on the face of it, it's a little bit lower per issue. However, we, you don't get all the additional services that we get as part of the bundle. But I'm happy to look at it again uh, for the next term of council. Okay, thank you, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fanlin. I don't have any comments on it, no. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Brian, you, you explained everything that I was I had questions on, so appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Lego. No, I have uh, nothing for Brian at this time. Thank you. Uh, Clerk, anything to wrap up or you're done? Uh, no, uh, unless there are other questions from council, I'm uh, happy to let the next person take their turn. Just be aware of the, the of the coming weeks. You may you may get more questions. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, tre Treasurer. Back to you. I have one more question. Certainly, Councillor Howie. Go ahead. Yeah, similar to the the question I, I asked the fire chief, um, could you or, or the treasurer provide a, a breakdown of kind of the how, how the figure of wages for the IT department was um, calculated? If that's shared across uh, several positions, and then. Um, how that would be balanced towards outsourced or contracted services. Um, because the, the figures are close, but um, anyway, take it away. Sure. Uh, so uh, we do have a, um, uh, we presently have a full-time um, IT coordinator, uh, which works for the municipality. Um, however, um, we, uh, there are a number of services that uh, we just uh, aren't able to provide in-house. Um, and so those are the types of things that we do contract out. Um, um, there's a, uh, a strong relationship between the staff person and the contractor. So um, we're able to manage um, that in, in, in sort of a unique way um, in, in terms of how that relationship works. And um, it does, um, one of the advantages in working uh, with the, the, uh, the contractor is that uh, uh, when we're looking at uh, pricing for, uh, for uh, software and hardware, um, because uh, they're a bigger purchaser than we are, um, we actually do uh, quite often receive, uh, realize um, significant savings on, on hardware and software purchases because they're done through the contractor um, and we get, uh, you know, we achieve economies of scale and therefore um, uh, the, the price we pay for um, 
I'd say the vast majority of our, our hardware and software is, is certainly far below what, you know, you would typically see, uh, you know, at cost on a website or, you know, in Best Buy or whatever the case may be. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Clerk. Hearing nothing else, I'll go back to the treasurer once again. Thank you, Brian. Now, next we move into council and the office of the CAO. I will hand it off to the CAO now to present those budgets. Uh, thank you, Carly, and to you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, these budgets are at, uh, relatively uh, large compared to other departments. Um, one of the things that you will notice in the line items is there's an overall savings in the council's budget of approximately $18,400. And that's due part and part to reducing, um, reducing the travel and training uh, budgets uh, there because of COVID. It's not anticipated that there will be a lot of out of town travel. And given that a lot of um, various um, agencies like uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, OGRA and uh, Rural uh, um, Municipal Ontario Association are doing their conferences virtually. Uh, there is a cost to participate virtually, but a lot of the cost to travel to these conferences because they're usually in Southern Ontario is, is a large part of that expense. So we've reduced the travel and training in that area in the, in the council's budget. Uh, the mayor's was reduced by 7,500 and um, councillor's baths was reduced uh, by 2,000 from 2020 to 2021, respectively. And under contracted services, there's a reduction. There was 9,000 in the budget last year and it was taken out, or sorry, this year for 2020. And it was taken out for 2021 because it was a one-time uh, contracted services amount that was used in 2020. The CAO uh, budget includes the administer the executive assistant as well. So most of the changes in that budget too are a reduction due to travel and training. And uh, because it's not anticipated that, of course, my travel is, is, is not extensive, as extensive as the mayor's, but I do attend the larger conferences and that's a large part of it. Uh, so the, the cost for the travel and training will be strictly virtual uh, registration fees for some of those conferences. Um, we reduced a little bit of money in our supplies, uh, due part and part, be partly because uh, the clerk's budget as well um, is taking on the, the total cost of our photocopying. So we're not using individual printers and having to replace the cartridges, which are very expensive. And again, the contracted services was reduced by about $200. And again, the gas and fuel uh, for the municipal vehicle for council travel and um, um, or municipal travel is contained in my budget. And um, it was reduced uh, by about $500. Uh, we still use the municipal vehicle, but we don't anticipate having to use it as much because of COVID and uh, because it's mostly used locally and not to go to meetings out of town. So when looking at the budget versus actuals for 2020, I was able to reduce that slightly. So overall in those two budgets, we have a slight uh, decrease uh, of about maybe 26,000. Thank you. Um, I'll go around the council table, starting Councillor Howie. Thank you, Michelle. You uh, you answered my questions perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, I don't think I have any comments or questions at this time. Thank you, Councillor Bath. Well, yeah, just a, a quick. Probably a comment rather than a question. I think I'd certainly like to see some further increase or decreases, I'm sorry, in travel and training. I just don't think anybody's going anywhere. And I don't think this year coming is going to be anybody going anywhere. It's mostly going to be virtual. And, and the other thing I, I'd like to have some discussion about, probably not now, but it's, it's sometime in the future, is the fact is that council really doesn't have much expense in, uh, in this COVID period. You know, we we pretty pretty well doing all of our stuff from home or virtually, so we I think we need to have a look at that whether we do a one time cut back on how much our uh, we get as a salary. I think the sat the, the mayor does ninety nine percent of the work, 
I believe the councils right now don't do a lot of work as far as I mean, certainly you meet people on the street and you chat a bit, but I don't think there's a lot of real council uh, uh, work going on uh, as an individual. So uh, I think we should, uh, we should be prepared to maybe slice these, those two items a little bit. Uh, I'm prepared to for sure. Um, if I may, Your Worship. Um, so as far as the travel and training goes, what I did was uh, the normal allocation per councillor is $4,000 um, that has been consistent uh, for some time. What I did is I reached out to each of the councillors uh, when doing the budget and asked if they wanted their budget to remain the same or they were interested in reducing it or whether they thought they should increase it. So. Um, from 2019 to 2020, the budget did go down for some councillors for their travel because they felt that they didn't need the $4,000. So that was uh, mainly um, in Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Lagos uh, budgets. So if council would, like when we get to the end of this meeting tonight, um, of course, we're looking for council direction on what it is we're looking for uh, to balance the budget this year. So if there is any opportunity to, to cut the budgets, I would just ask if council wants to consider it that they let me know so we can make those uh, those uh, those cuts uh, as far as travel and training for individual counselors and as far as the wages that would be a council decision thank you thank you anything further councillor bath no that's it thank you councillor fenland Yeah, I don't have any questions here. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks for that, Michelle. Um, yeah, I'd definitely be willing to, to go zero on my travel and training going forward from this. Um, also, could you remind me the donations that we have in there for 20,500? 20, 20, Is that there? Some of the donations to uh, various agencies around town that we've approved through bylaws is that what that uh, wraps up uh through uh, mayor lawrence the grants and donations are a, a number of items uh, there they, they range from year to year a lot of it is donations to uh towards the uh Bearskin Golf Tournament, uh, various uh, events like that, Blueberry Festival, things of that nature. Um, there was substantially down this court this year in 2020, of course, because of COVID, a lot of events did not happen and we did not get as many requests. The reason why I left it the same is I'm being cautious. <laughs> the same for 2021 is I'm being cautiously optimistic that we are going to return to some kind of normalcy at some point in the year. So those donation requests or those grants will be coming back to council for their requests. So I don't want to leave us too short because then we will be over budget. Um, I could take another look at that to see if it can be reduced slightly given the fact that we still are in COVID, but most of our activities where we do give donations and grants happen during the summer and more so in the fall events, uh, not necessary during the winter months. So that's why I'm cautiously, um, I'm not keen on changing it too much with the hopes that we will get back to some kind of normalcy. No, I, th I think your approach is right in that. And uh, I just wanted some clarification exactly what was built in there. So thank you. I can give you a, a, an exact breakdown of what we actually donated over the last two years and I can circulate it to council or bring it back. Appreciate to it. Thank you. Thank you. That's it, Councillor Cassidy. Yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lego. Yeah, uh, that same kind of question that Councillor Cassidy just brought to the table. Um, I would prefer to see some kind of reduction from the donations, but uh, we can have that discussion. And when it's brought back to council, we'll discuss it some more. So. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, when we think of these donations, it's um, you'll often see we'll can, we'll can, a request for council to contribute to, to something and when pe people name or they may say the municipality. Uh, this is the line where that, that comes from. This is, it doesn't come from public works or something else. This is the line that for our contributions to the Skip to Equip or the Bearskin Golf Classic, the Many Ellen Health Center Foundation. Um, to name a few uh, where they come from here, but I think uh, a listing would be would be 
would be worthwhile uh, for a final decision on on this. Thanks, CAO. Anything else, CAO, for for this portion? No, that that is it, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Treasurer. Back to you. Thank you, Michelle. I have, Sorry, I have one more have? question. Okay. Um, yeah, similar to what the other councillor said, I think a uh, reduction in that travel and training um, to a zero uh, potentially for this this year. I think electronic participation in meetings, um, at least for outside boards and commissions, is proving fruitful. Um, I'd like to see, again, a reduction in those donations um, and possibly we could look at some kind of in-kind contribution um, later on. And could the, the CAO or, or clerk provide uh, clarity on uh, if, if there is a budgeted item um, or if it is outside contributions for any kind of compensation uh, to to council uh, for participation in any uh, boards or uh, commissions. Thank you. If I may, through you, uh, Mayor Lawrence, the compensation that councillors receive is oh, that report always goes to council early in the new year for the previous year. And it's a, it's a legislated report that has to be brought to council. Uh, so what we can do, um, Councillor Howie, for your, for your information is we can send you that report that was presented to council in 2020. Yeah, I can't remember the timing, but in maybe it's January February. or February, it, it uh, is presented to councillors. So exactly what you're asking for is already being done. It's legislated and it's available uh, on an annual basis, Councillor Howie. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was just um, trying to figure out for um, uh, outside questions coming in from, I know some councillors participate in, in various boards. I think that's, beyond, the report that, uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. the report that uh, the CAO was referring to. Yes, uh, I was it, just clarifying that that didn't come out of this budget. Oh, sorry. No, it no, it doesn't. That remuneration that remuneration that council that some councillors receive by being on certain boards or uh, commission uh, does not come out of our budget. It comes out of the bud the budgets of the uh, agencies or organizations that they are a member of uh, on the board. Thank but you. it's our responsibility to report all that information to council. So what we do at year end is we go to the different agencies and boards and ask them uh, for a tally of what the councillor or the mayor received as remuneration and or uh, travel allowance. And that gets reported to council in a comprehensive report that uh, speaks to remuneration as a councillor and your travel as a councillor um, on council as, as well as other outside agencies or boards. Thank you. Anything further? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like Dr. to just, yeah, just like to comment on the, you know, the reduction in travel and training. And obviously it, there will be less this year, but I, I would like to caution that the people that are, are are sort of downplaying the travel and training and, and not wanting to do it. And particularly the first year, the first term counselors, you, you cannot underestimate how overestimate how enriching it can be to be part of some of to be part of the bigger picture and it doesn't mean you have to go to every every uh, conference obviously but it is very valuable to go to the uh, the Kenora district um, municipal uh, meeting it, it's very valuable to find out what other uh, councils are doing um, and the the um, I noticed that some of them are going to be in person or they're scheduled to be in person uh, in June and in April. We don't know if that'll happen, but I think you're, I think you're going to be uh, playing yourself short if you say you're not going to do any travel or take any training this year, because it is, it is, it, 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 we need to have that bigger picture in order to, in order to do what we do here well. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. It isn't the same virtually. It just is not the same virtually. Thank you. Anything further, Council, for the CAO on this portion of the budget? It. Um, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Timpson on on that issue that she she talked about. Um, 
Uh, we should have something for reserve in case we have to actually go down to Toronto or Ottawa to uh, talk to the ministers. Thanks. Is it okay? Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, I uh, I asked the CIO to reduce uh, my travel budget, which she did considerably, maybe not as much as I had asked, but I, I'm nervous uh, to uh, eliminate eliminate just because of the reason that Councillor Fenlon has uh, just said. Uh, it could the opportunity to save the the money, save the municipality a lot of money, could be had by uh, uh, a person an in person meeting with a minister, and the cost of the travel would be reasonably nominal if uh, when we get that success. I think if the trip I made to Toronto last December, which was uh, funded out of this budget to meet with the Solicitor General, a uh, meeting I'd requested, and it, it resulted in us being able to extend our policing cost subsidy uh, for another year. Um, I think the, the trip was, was financially well worth it for the municipality. So I don't want to, every trip isn't like that, uh, that's for sure but I, I don't want to strip it down to nothing and, and take away that ability, which may mean the difference in something really uh, quite significant for the municipality. Yeah, I think uh, one of the, the uh, initial things that we should keep track of is our, uh, our uh, tie to the uh, Benny Allen Hospital and the beds that are um, extended care beds that we are still trying to push through. That, you know, we haven't heard too much about it since we've been in COVID, but I don't know where that stands right now. It is a different topic, but the CAO, CAO and I have been uh, discussing with the CEO of the hospital and uh, trying to do joint uh, advocacy with the, the Minister of Health, with not just the municipality, but many other in the municipality together. So it it hasn't disappeared. Uh, that would probably be, it would be a virtual uh, uh, delegation. It wouldn't be in person because that would be, a, we hope, coming up in the next few months. Yeah, okay. That's good for me. All right. Uh, let's see, no, no more hands are here. Nothing more. I'll go back to you, Treasurer. Thank you, CAO. Oh, CAO, sorry. Go back to you. Sorry, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, I just want to address one of Councillor um, Howie's comments with reference to the grants and donations. We are, as mentioned, uh, going to go back and take a look at that. I just wanted to indicate though, that uh, when you said that we should be considering a lot more in-kinds, the municipality does a significant amount of in-kind contributions with staff resources and equipment for a number of things, uh, including the uh, golf tournament, the Bearskin Golf Tournament, the Blueberry Festival. So we already do a lot of that stuff it's just not shown because it's in kind so I just wanted to make sure that uh, Councillor Howie was aware that we do significant in kind already all right I have one more one more comment Councillor Timpson just comment on, on the travel and training you know there are ways of, of, of economizing when we do travel um, we don't have to stay in the the most expensive hotels um, all our meals are Usually, all your meals are, are provided, so you don't need your you don't need your uh, your meal allowance that day. We can carpool all all kinds of ways in which we can do it a lot more uh, economically. Uh, some of us don't need the the per diem when we go. You know, there's all kinds of ways of of uh, economizing on this, which we which we really haven't explored in the past. So. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I, uh, no, uh, not demeaning your your point, but COVID has been the greatest economizer of all this year in terms of all that. So uh, pretty well shut down travel. CAO, is that, uh, thank you. Treasurer, back to you. Thank you. Now we head on over to development services. This includes the building department, facilities department, and planning. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. So uh, just due to uh, you know everything that's going on, I tried to limit any kind of increase. Uh, kind of same thing across the board, reducing my travel and training budget lines by quite a bit. Uh, 
And then uh, so with facilities, we the biggest savings there was our facilities equipment line, which we dropped by 10,000 as well. Uh, we have uh, 22 contracted service lines for one for each kind of facility that we take care of. So I just took care and reduced those where I could and where I felt I could. Uh, again, travel and training, a small reduction for facilities. Planning, we see a slight increase, but that is uh, in part due to I've increased our contracted service line because while well, last year we were heading in the right direction with our planning coordinator where she was kind of being able to tackle more stuff on her own. This year, we will be a little more reliant again on our consultant until our new planning coordinator who starts January 4th, thank goodness, uh, will be uh, you know kind of in training. Although she does have planning education, this is kind of her first job as a planning, you know, in the planning field. So, well, as she hopefully sticks around and gets uh, more comfortable in her position, our reliance on the consultants will reduce and we'll see a reduction in that again next year. Uh, the lease increase is due to uh, uh, another rental at the uh, train station. I think that's an increase of $8,000 for that building. Overall, yeah, I, I think I, I kept it where it should be, and uh, I think we can work with that. Thank you. Go around the table, Councillor Howley. Thank you, uh, Jody. Uh, I don't have any questions. Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, I don't think so uh, right now. Maybe the next time around. Councillor Bath. No, I, I'm okay. I don't have any. Councillor Fenlon. No, I'm good with it. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, Jody, could you? I was just going through all the, like, the buildings and stuff, and could you explain the taxes for the Hugh Allen Clinic and how those kind of come about? I think it was the only building I see us paying tax or have a taxes line item on. I'll uh, defer through Mayor Lawrence to Carly on that one. The building itself is assessed by impact, which is then taken into effect with our tax rate. Uh, every building does have or should have a uh, property tax uh, line or it would say taxes. If there is a building that doesn't, it's because that building is um, exempted from taxation according to um, impact and uh, the category that it falls under. So we do have buildings um, that we're exempt with and buildings that we do have to pay taxes on. So if you do not see a taxation line in regards to that area of the building, it's because it's exempt. Okay, thank you. Um... One more for Jody, the train station. If we operate that train station at full capacity with every um, office in there occupied, can that building can that building be self-sufficient and cover its own costs? Uh, three, Mayor Lawrence. Uh, just let me take a quick look at the, the, the bills there. Uh, but honestly, uh, there's not a lot of leasable space in that building, as you you know aware. In that building, the kind of the corridors and the hallways are quite large, uh, in both the upstairs and the down. So you're kind of limited, really. What we have left for leasable space is uh, is about a probably about 1,500 square feet on the second floor. So if you're going to charge around 30 bucks a square foot, that's kind of the additional revenue you can see there. And I think the expenses there are, so you're looking at an expenses of, you know, including kind of all of our uh, wages and benefits and supplies and utilities of 261,000. Currently the rental value is 34,000. So I, I, unfortunately I don't think this building would would self-sustain, you could say. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's too bad. Thanks for that, Jody. Thank you, Councillor Lego. 
Yeah, just a question for the treasurer. How many more years do we have of debt payments on the train station? Um, I would need to look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, actually, those are my questions too. I, I'm just looking at the um, it, it, the 1,500 square feet, uh, $30 a square foot for that kind of space would be reasonable. So you could get uh, 45,000 a year. And if the debt were gone, you're getting close to a break even point. Not quite, it's, it's you're sort of like 80,000 80, of income and 83,000 of, of uh, expense excluding debt. So uh, getting the debt paid would be key and getting more uh, of that prime space leased out at prime rate would be key to to uh, bring that to a break even point. Anything further uh, for uh, uh, facilities building? All right, and uh, Jody, anything further from you? Uh, through Mayor Lawrence, I'm expecting some questions on my my con or my <laughs> my capital projects because I'm the only increase. So I'll wait for that. Oh, okay, thank you, Treasurer. Back to you. Thanks, Jody. Now we go into the daycare department. Uh, the daycare manager couldn't uh, attend tonight's meeting, so I will try my best to give you an overview as to what's going on with the daycare and possibly answer any questions. If for whatever reason I don't have the answer, I will um, make sure to pass that information along to the daycare manager to provide some insight if uh, I can't make that available for you guys. So the daycare has an increase of 182,982 from last year to this year's. So the biggest impact that the daycare is having was, or is, I should say, uh, COVID-19. Um, as everyone knows, we've had to um, change how we register our kids, how many kids we can take, uh, with the daycare being closed for as long as it was, and with all the changes with um, other um organizations around town people are able to work from home or they're able to manage uh, their work a little bit differently that being said uh, both of our daycares at the current moment is running at 50 percent capacity i uh, am aware that the daycare manager has called everyone that is currently on the waiting list or was on the waiting list to see if they needed a space. Either they don't need a space because they decided to um, not place their kids in school and they are homeschooled, or they have made arrangements with their employer that they can work from home, so therefore they don't need the daycare, and or they've made arrangements with family to um, help manage uh, multiple kids with in regards to that. So therefore that means our registration is down for both daycares. Because our registration is down, so is KDSB's funding that they supply to the daycare because of that. So even though we have less kids, we still need to manage the amount of employees that we currently have. Right now we do have some vacancies that we are currently possibly not um, or that we're looking at restructuring in regards to positions for the casual staff that are currently not uh, filled at the moment. However, all the full-time positions have all come back and we do need them in order to manage the daycare with at 50 capacity for what it is right now. They have done a reduction in travel and training like everybody else knowing that it, oh, at least for 50% of next year, no one will possibly be able to travel and everything else. A lot of the training is done in the fall and is done online. So that is still stayed within the budget. The, the Like I said before, the biggest effect is um, the COVID-19 and 
because other employees have managed to either work from home or made arrangements with other families because that's what they've had to do in the summertime of this year um, due to the daycares coming um, closed because of all the different government um, legislations that have had an effect on it. Um, the registration is what it is and the daycare manager has budgeted for that same uh, registration into 2021. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Councillor Howie. Yes, uh, thank you, Treasurer, for stepping in. Uh, do you have any information on it? If, if the daycare is operating at uh, approximately 50% capacity, has there been then a reduction in the staffing volume um, at each respective daycare? I see there is a, a wage difference for, for 2021, uh, $130,000 approximately, a reduction in wages for the uh, Bedauvin daycare. Uh, however, a $24,000 increase, and I know you did mention this is associated with fees and, and so forth, but a $24,000 increase at the Sioux Mountain Daycare. Um, you can touch on that. A lot of it is wages that have um, increased according to contracts. The other part of it is the benefits, like I did mention at uh, the beginning of the year. All the staff that's currently um, hired and there at the current moment, we need to keep. Um, we need to have those in case um, more registrations uh, start to beef up, up a little bit more and to help uh, maneuver from daycare to daycare if people were to call in sick and everything else. So the the staff, we need to have the staff that it's currently there in order to manage what we have there as well. And in case the registration slowly starts going up once um, we get back to the new normal. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, can I speak, Carly, too? Can I add something? Yeah. Um, so there has been a reduction in staff. Um, we, the daycare, um, in a typical year would use a lot of extra um, casual or um, like two hour staff for after school programming or before school programming. Um, because we're not running um, those type of programs and we're not at capacity, um, we don't need those extra casual staff. So that's saving money. Um, we do have um, quite a few actually employees at the daycare who are on maternity leave. Um, so we've had to replace them. So those employees are in terms. Um, with everything that's going on with COVID, usually you would know that an employee is coming back, but we're not sure. So um, we have to maintain those terms. Um, we had to fill them. Um, we've had a lot of trouble in the past um, hiring at the daycare, finding qualified staff. And Giselle would be able to speak to this better than I am, but um, we've had a lot of talk about staffing. And um, like Carly mentioned, if a staff person is away, so we do have um, a lot of senior staff with um, vacation, sick time, things like that. Um, and they're away. It's not like other departments where we can simply not replace them. Where usually we would replace them with casuals, which would save a little bit of money. But because we have to keep our permanent employees, they're replacing each other. Um, so we have reduced staff, but the cost is coming from those permanent staff. Um, we did do the layoffs, as Carly mentioned um, earlier in the year. Um, and for, without getting too much in the weeds, there are maximum amount of time you can actually lay people off. So um, it's a fine line to walk to, um, because if then the um, ratios do go up, um, we may not be able to accept more children if we don't have our staffing. So it's probably one of the trickiest departments to um, staff because it's unlike other departments when you can just throw somebody else in, somebody has to be qualified and things like that. And that's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, if, with the question of uh, repurposing staff when, when things are, are busy and bringing in additional casual staff, is there an opportunity then um, with those uh, additional staff we're trying to keep on um, and, and just keep 
within the within the municipality to repurpose them within uh, different departments that may be uh, struggling um, or in in fact to uh, almost an in-kind contribution to local non-for-profit groups um, potentially in, in draft two of the budget we could see uh, that in-kind contribution or donation actually quantified um, as we have with cash donation. Um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, COVID's put a lot of restrictions on how we staff our daycare and how it operates. Um, there, I'm not sure of the exact restrictions right now, but it's very strict as to where the staff can work. Um, I know they're not supposed to, or at one point they weren't supposed to move from building to building. Um, I think it might be a little bit more lenient now, but with the new rules, um, the staff are supposed to stay with their groups of children to um, limit the exposure. Um, and also our daycare staff are unionized. So we um, are kind of bound by their um, job descriptions. So it's a little bit more tricky. Um, they have, most of the daycare staff are specialized in what they do. It's, you know, um, it'd be different if it was somebody who was in an administrative position, but they're, you know, fully trained to do what they're doing. Um, so while that is a, you know, a, a good solution, um, I don't know if it would be one that would fit within that department because it is a more specialized department and with the COVID rules and everything like that, um, moving staff around would be a little bit more tricky. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howley. Councillor Timpson. Uh, yeah, with respect to the 50% uh, capacity that you're at, you're at now, uh, that has nothing to do with COVID restrictions, does it? They haven't reduced the number of um, children you can have in a facility, have they? That's strictly due to the parents withdrawing the children at this time, is that correct? So when the daycare was able to reopen, um, after it got shut down, there was all new legislations and rules that came out as to how many kids we were allowed to take um, compared to how many um, employees that we had to look after. The, from that, uh, it was a lot lower when it first reopened than what uh, we can take right now. We have gone back to um, I guess you could say status quo as to how many uh, kids we are allowed to the amount of employees that we have. However, because um, that restriction was in place when we reopened, parents had to find other means for their children. Either they have found um, family members to look after their kids or they're able to work from home and they've made that arrangements with their employees or they've decided not to put their kids in school. And so therefore that has taken into an effect. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I also thought of something that Giselle would probably speak about. So I would like to add it. Um, and I don't know the ratio numbers. I just know we've had these conversations in passing. So just kind of to provide an example of how complicated it is. Um, let's say in a toddler room, they're allowed eight children um, at the max or and five at the minimum. Um, so we're sitting at the minimum or lower or like, so let's say we have five toddlers. We need two um, either ECs or otherwise approved ECs in the room. Um, so not all of our staff are um, ECs or otherwise approved. Um, we have staff that are um, like teaching assistants and stuff. So they help out on breaks and things like that. Um, so we could increase, we can increase how many children we bring in without increasing staff. Um, so we're sitting at that kind of fine line where we need that many staff to cover breaks, to cover unexpected um, people being off. And um, we've seen our staff have to be off to get COVID tests quite, a, quite often due to their children being in school or um, there's exposure somewhere else or just being sick um, with the daycare rules. If they um, have any type of illness, they have to get tested um, because they are around um, children. Um, so we're seeing staff be out for things like that that they wouldn't usually be. 
Um, so because of the way the ratios work, because there's kind of a, a gap between the lowest and highest amount of children you can have in a class, but you still need to have those amount of teachers, um, it makes it a little bit more difficult again. So um, I, I believe Giselle's done like the best she can in regards to um, working with the staff she has and not hiring additional um, casual staff to help fill in the gaps. Um, the daycare staff have been doing an excellent job of kind of covering for each other in those circumstances. Thank you. I'll move to Councillor uh, Bath. Yeah, I, I, uh, I know, of course, notice the, uh, the increase uh, in, the, in the salaries or in the in expense, I guess, from one year to the other. I was on the daycare committee for the last term of council, and I know the, re the problems we had getting uh, 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 staff. I would certainly be very reluctant to even consider trying to cut back on the staff. If you look at the numbers, the numbers that are affecting us are not expenses, it's, it's, it's revenue. So hopefully, if, if we'll be as positive as our airport manager, they, they, we will uh, we'll see this go up and it'll level out. And we won't, hopefully we won't see this by the end of the year, but I, I would be really reluctant to think about uh, reducing staff at the daycares. And Melissa pretty well covered all the points on that. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Fenlon. No, I have no comment on it. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, no, I'm, I, uh, I, I second what uh, Councillor Bass said there with regards to the staffing. I think we got to be very careful. Um, up until the last daycare meeting, we had the biggest challenge was getting staffing, getting staffing. And then now we have staffing and COVID impacted our numbers and our, our revenue. And then we want to, we got to be careful about that. The other thing to consider from from the last meeting too is there's about I can't remember the exact number but I believe it's around 40 infants waiting to age into the program so if we start looking at reducing staff numbers there there is a waiting list but it's just they're waiting for kids to age in not kids that are of age waiting to get into the programming so that's something else to consider here as well so I think I think this is just showing the impacts of COVID and what's happened here and I think we do need to be very careful if we want to start tinkering with the staffing at the daycare. So thank you, Treasurer and HR. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Councillor Lego. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Bath and Councillor Cassidy. I think the only hope we have is that there's a third round of municipal COVID funding coming in 2021. So to cover some of these losses that we're gonna experience with, with COVID and how it's affecting uh, especially the daycare at this moment. So, thank you. Thank you. I think it's all been said and explained here. Uh, anything to wrap up on this, either uh, uh, Treasurer or HR? All right, Treasurer, then back to you. We'll move on to the next area. Thank you. Next department is development, uh, economic development. And I will hand it over to Vicki to explain. So I have a um, relatively small um, budget. It has been decreasing annually since I arrived. So I take pleasure in that. This year, I reduced the operating budget by $20,714. Yet I have a full-time employee now since May. So um, I think we've done our due diligence. We, we looked very carefully at, at um, the budget and as everyone else, um, you can't do economic development at your desk under normal circumstances. You have to go out and seek and attract. So I did have a, a very healthy uh, budget. I also, for travel and training in the past, I also, that budget was also applied to certain projects, capital projects, not capital as in cap your capital, but in capital projects um, in attracting funders to, to fund our capital projects, which was required 
many a times for us to meet with um, designated um, departments and ministers. Um, so that has really decreased. Um, there is a slight increase um, of $8,900 in the project um, capacity. That is really because I've, I, we are in a process of what's called the system impact analysis for our, our hydro or our, our power. Um, and through that process, we have to go through a grueling process of IESO and Hydro One. And um, I've increased um, this year additional dollars um, as per the energy plan to continue to have some sort of expertise um, um, and non-biased opinions um, guide um, uh, mayor and council and administration in ensuring that the cost of growth in the far north is not put on the shoulders of our, our system and our ratepayers. So I have to increase that so that we could maybe access that knowledge and base in which we could proceed. This impact analysis, um, system impact analysis and the process that we're going through um, to ensure that we have power to grow and, and, and in our review, we would increase, uh, we, there's a need to double our power capacity by 2030. So it's very important that we watch that and that doesn't end up on our our, our shoulders of our residents. Um, Carly, I don't see my I don't see my 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 slide, so I'm sort of going on my memory right now. Sorry, I accidentally hit the button. And that's okay. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, well, I kind of memorized it. It's not that big, guys. <laughs> um, it's still blank to me, but I do remember it. So in addition um, to, to that, I did put a little bit of extra money into training. Um, the, the executive assistant and, and I, I would say maybe um, trainee, economic development trainee, um, I would like to register into a training program through EDAC, the Economic Development Association of Canada, which is a normal process of learning outside of, of normal business what economic development is. So I have I've included that into my budget this year to ensure that she can go as I sunset eventually in my, my years. Um, outside of that, um, all the projects that you see um, on my um, list right now are not funded by, by, by uh, uh, the municipality or the taxpayer. I do quite a bit of work in finding partnerships and assist and, and funds outside of that. So these are all private sector funded projects. That would be the drone project, as well as the tourism, COVID tourism modification project. Um, we sought, and I thank Mayor Lawrence for his advocacy. Uh, we sought uh, the funds that we needed to, to bring this to, to top of mind and look after our regional businesses that the domino effect from the tourism industry has decimated some of our, our small and large businesses have been impacted. And so uh, Destination Northern Ontario has come to our defense and, and has provided our, our seed money for that project. Most of my largest projects, it looks like I don't do very much. I only got the small projects, but most of our large projects um, fall under the public works and um, and under um, uh, development services in which we continue to work together um, collectively to raise funds and, and, and attract investment in developers community. I do wanna continue um, to be very assertive or aggressive in attracting investors and developers to our region as we've been very successful in Northwestern Ontario, I've been advised by many consultants that this is the only place to knock on doors for work. And we've been extremely busy. COVID, as it has been hard on others, has been very, very positive in the Economic Development Office. It has given us time to plan and work with developers and investors that have a bit more extra time on their hands. So 
that's pretty much all I have to, to contribute tonight. And thank you very much for um, uh, listening. Thanks. Uh, we'll go around the table. Sorry, uh, staff are working on the slide deck, trying to get it back to uh, uh, the economic de development slide, I believe. So um, there we go. I'll go around the table, starting with Councillor Howie. Yeah, thank you, Vicky, for your presentation. Uh, one thing that you mentioned was uh, your efforts to um, prevent things from falling on the rate pair. Uh, so one of my questions is you mentioned a projected doubling of a power increase. Um, so if you could touch more on that. And then I also noticed in the uh, special projects, uh, you, you did say that each project was um, funded and but uh, under the resource sector uh, project, I see there's no revenue entered. Is there funding in, in the works for that project? Um, and that $20,000 uh, as an expenditure will be, will be at zero? Um, those are my two questions, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll go back to the increases. I think you misinterpreted that. What our report that was given to us uh, through our consultants and through the impact and now the desktop analysis to go be approved to go to a system impact assessment said that based on all of their review of the region and the growth anticipated growth under and IESO in, in um, um, also input on that our requirement for power will double based on those developments not increase our 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 amount but to meet that growth and participate in that development and to see incremental inc um growth in the area we would need to double that and we don't want that necess the growth of nor far north to put be put on the shoulders of us as it would be right now they would say this is just sulaco growing so gr sulaco pays and we, we are lobbying that, that um, it is not just about Sulco, it's about the far north and the regional growth in the region. So I just trying to make sure that we continue to have um, the expertise available to us to, to contradict any larger corporations or, or um, in, in um, regulators and that we, we do have that knowledge and um, as far as um, the $20,000 in resource, that sort of goes across the board in all resource sectors. Um, we're per currently um, being faced um, with the opportunity for Treasure Metals has bought in Goldland and they have an aggressive timeline of 2021 to start open pit in both Goldland and, and uh, Goliath now. Um, so there will be a lot of work involved in, in attraction and working with them in, in employment and housing, et cetera. They have contacted us. We have met with them. There is a lack of housing and capacity outside of our community um, in the region. And so they're looking to look out to see if we can assist in filling that void. And as well, our, our, we are working very closely with our forest industry. But um, thirdly, um, again, is the energy is part of that resource sector. And, but um, it's really, I'm looking for seed money. Um, I, I don't do many projects or um, we, the magnitude of some of these costs far outweigh what the small contribution that we can make in, in our community based on our, our population per capita. So, um, you know, I always use the 10 to 20, 25% ratio. 20,000 can bring me either 200,000 or $2 million. So I'm, I'm always very conscious of that. And I think I have a track record of that. So that's really a seed. And hopefully we would have revenue come in there, yeah. Good, Councilor Harvey. Yeah, th thank you, Vicky, for clarifying that it's uh, not just Sulaco, but regionally. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Um, no, I don't think I have any questions just, just now. Thank you, Vicky. Councillor Bath. 
no, Vicky, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Councillor Fenlon. No, and I don't have anything to say. It's nice to see projects are still moving around and moving on. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, no, sorry, Vicky, I must have misunderstood you. So exactly what are we getting for that that twenty thousand in the uh, in the resource sector? Because I see there was forty thousand last year that was funded by grants or from government funding. So what are we what are we getting for that contracted services this year exactly? You're saying it's seed money? It's seed money. Vicky, you're muted. I sure told him, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I think, Joe. No. <laughs> I'll lighten the air here. Um, no, Joe, I apologize. Um, in normal in normal circumstances, I, I would have a whole line of things that I want to put in there. Unfortunately, FedNor and uh, NOHSC shut down their programs until January this year, and they've gone into uh, to uh, you know what is it called? <laughs> Carbonation Help mode. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Lawrence. Thank you very much. Um, so. I'm, I'm anticipating there will be more money, but it's across the sectors. It's trying to stay involved, attracting investors in traction. We do have opportunity for manufacturing now around some of the projects that we're looking at. And we're working very closely for the first time with Domtor on many opportunities for road access and manufacturing since they put their chipping plant in. So these are all very, you're on mute, Vicky. Oh, gee. And that too, Joe. <laughs> anyway, so we're having many meetings around that. And so I'm just trying to make sure that I don't lose focus. In the past, I, I did have some comments from council that, you know, I, I have to look at all resources. And I think I always was, but it's heightened now because we've into, we, we've in, we've encouraged the dialogue and the partnerships and now they're coming to fruition. We need to continue to participate. And sometimes that means putting some, some meat in the game, right? You know, so. Um, with us, there, so with us approving this, sorry. So with us approving this 20,000, it's gonna potentially when the funding agencies come out of hibernation, it's gonna have some ramifications and allow us to access more funding. Absolutely, that's the whole plan. Yes, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lego. Yeah, I just uh, want to temper everyone's expectations, uh, council, administrative uh, staff, that if our the the southern border does not open this summer it's going to be a dire consequence for the tourism in our, in our area. So we need to be cognizant of that possibility and take that into consideration when we move forward with this budget. I, I like, I like some up, I'm an optimistic person, but the way things are going, it's just, it's, I don't have a good feeling about this. So I just want to make sure that we temper our expectations on what's gonna happen over the next six, eight, 10, 12 months, because to me, it doesn't look good. Through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, may I comment on Certainly. Um, I can tell you, Corey, that a, I'd say 40% of my time has been allotted to addressing this issue and working with the resorts and lodges and, and the trickle effect into other businesses. Um, we have a, a, a strong working group um, through Mayor Lawrence and, and the Economic Development Department and Administration. We have gone outside of our boundaries to attract. We are we're the first COVID project for Destination Northern Ontario. NOTO has joined us. We have Sunset Country 100% behind us. We are doing everything in our power. And some of these dollars and resources are going to lead to that support and 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 putting in some of the necessary 
uh, aids into our region uh, to address this um, issue. Not and and they're looking at Sulacote as a pilot to becoming part of their toolkit for destination Ontario, Northern Ontario. So I, I I agree with you, but I can tell you that Sulacote is far out front in in addressing this issue. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Councillor Lego. Yeah, I'll just uh, wrap up with some thoughts here. The um, some of these are just spinoffs. On the on the hydro that uh, Vicky was talking about, um, one of the things engaged in here is the Sam Lake Raid uh, Sam Lake Radar Sam Lake um, distribution station, the transformer station at Sam Lake, which is is really the, the key for uh, everything for Sulacote hydro coming in is in need of upgrading. And, and what we're trying to do is say, look, uh, it needs to be upgraded because the North is growing and Sulacote is growing and Sulacote, they're, they're sort of symbiotic. The North needs us to grow for them to grow. So we, we feel that just as transmission and so many things are socialized across the, 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 the province, the cost of developments, we we're lobbying to have the the costs of Sam Lake upgrades, uh, socialized, let's call it, uh, and, and shared by by the province and, and hydro, and not not just on the backs of uh, Sulacote Hydro and, and locally. So that was the, the the argument there. But that takes informed advocacy, and uh, uh, my expertise in, in electrical is I'm I'm sort of at times the spearhead for economic development. Economic development is is doing a lot of the work doing the work, but they need to engage consultants who have the expertise in, in, in hydro to convince the hydro people uh, of our, and we've done, we're making headway. Uh, uh, there's no, there's no guarantee at all that we'll succeed, but I know we, we would be stuck with the entire cost if we didn't try. We're hoping to, to try and do a good job of it. And that takes outside expertise and money uh, to help us do that and, and unburden some of the cost to Sulacote. On the mining sector, everybody will be following Goliath and Goldland are, are they're now one property. Uh, it's going to benefit Dryden, I would say hugely, but Sulacote has considerable expertise and opportunity to uh, to benefit from this as well. And so there's uh, constant uh, communication there to try and keep that alive. Uh, Cat Lake Road, which is a mining, in part it's a mining road, but now uh, economic development has turned turned it uh, by working with the First Nations through what was the, called the, the Shared Territory Protocol. And now uh, the First Nations have a lot of confidence in our economic development department. And um, Cat Lake wants the road to come this way, the mining road, uh, as does Domtar. Is, is, so Domtar, the mine, our economic development department are working with the First Nations and, and the government to try and get that all, all season access road coming south and not, not west to another community west of us. Um, uh, just today, there was another uh, conference meeting on uh, uh, addictions treatment center, uh, which um, detox treatment center, supportive housing. And this was really spearheaded by economic development, uh, getting other agencies to work together. And it was spearheaded because of our relationship with First Nations uh, that economic development has really fostered. There's, uh, hopefully, uh, this project has now got some real opportunity here. There was a provincial announcement today that uh, we have a very good um, uh, relationship with the minister responsible. So we're hoping in the next few months, there might be a serious development here. And then the tourism support, uh, totally agree with, uh, unfortunately agree, not that I, I mind agreeing with you, Councillor Lego, but the, the, I, I, I'm very pessimistic about uh, the US border and what's going to happen to the our local tourism industry. Uh, working with, I've been helping uh, economic development in, in any way I can through advocacy. Uh, economic development has been working hard and as, as Vicky explained, has, has certainly has a project on, but this isn't that we were talking about uh, over the last uh, few days and communicating through economic development has been communicating with with the, um, I think it's NOTO, the, the uh, Northern Ontario Tourism, Sunset Country and others. And we're trying to get together our, our next uh, our next uh, take to, to the provincial and federal governments to assist, to not leave this group of, of tourist operators behind because that's what's going to happen. They're, they're right now, they're falling through the cracks. The programs aren't working for this and it's through no fault of their own and they shouldn't. And so we're lobbying hard to try and 
do what we can to, to help that industry survive and get to the other side of all of this. So an economic development, sorry, is, is key. And I've just talked about five for a key in, in all of this. And, and uh, to, to your question about the resource sector, there needs to be some flexibility to be able to jump on uh, funding when it comes available. And the way the, the uh, provincial and federal governments are working right now, you don't know what's around the next corner, but you, you, you need to be ready to take advantage of it. Oops, sorry, that's uh, that's uh, just adding to the um, the comments from the economic development manager. So, anything else, council, on economic development? Good, uh, and you're you're wrapped up for now, uh, uh, Vicky. But you may get questions later, as as per everybody else. Thank you very and much. And later today or to next week. You just never know. They come around the corner any time. No. <laughs> over, okay. over the Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just going to take a quick break, though. So. <laughs> no, I'm going to declare. I, I'm I'm going to declare a, a, a five minute break. We've got some big ones coming up. I think Public Works and a few others. So, uh, the health break. Uh, come back. If everybody can come back at in five minutes. Uh, seven thirty. Seven seven thirty two. Thank you. All right, so treasurer, the treasurer is back. I hope. Don't see yeah. her. Yeah. Okay. Over to you for the uh, next department. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Lawrence. I uh, just to backtrack just a tiny little bit. I believe it was Councillor Lego that had asked when the train station loan was to be paid off. Yes. Um, and I did uh, grab the file on that while we were on a quick break. And it looks like it's to be completed in 2038. Long way to go. Yeah. Thanks for that, Treasurer. You're welcome. Uh, thank you to Vicki for the economic development uh, portion of her budget. I do apologize for uh, losing her slide there for a little bit. Next, we have uh, human resources, and I will pass it along to that manager. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, I hope everyone had a good break and drank some coffee so they can stay awake during this one. Um, so HR is a, a small budget in compared to most of the other departments. Um, so in overall, um, HR's budget went down. Um, so if you're looking at it line by line, you're going to see um, a large decrease in wages and benefits, and that's due to staffing changes within the department. Um, we had somebody retire. Um, I have a new HR administrator. Um, um, so that's the major change there. Um, HR, uh, I, I'm not going to lie, when COVID first hit, I thought that things would settle down. Um, because we anticipated layoffs, which meant less staff to support, but our department actually became very busy because even when staff are not actively at work, we still support them. Um, so there is um, an increase in uh, legal costs you will see. Um, and we do have some anticipated um, uh, contractual legal cost obligations that would be coming in 2021. So we wanted to ensure that that was um, budgeted accordingly. Um, contracted services um, also uh, went up. So I, I've noticed there's a lot of questions regarding contracted services. So in HR, um, there's only two of us in the department. So sometimes we do have to contract out work. Um, past examples of that would be in any type of investigations where there would be a conflict um, with myself um, or just something that is larger scale that my department cannot um, uh, take on. Um, we need to um, update our pay equity program and um, there's lots of um, details and um, stuff that goes into that. So that has been um, added to employment costs. Or, or yeah, sorry, or yes. Um, the other um, increase is contracted services, or sorry, contracted services is the one that I was just speaking about. Um, 
Another increase in contracted services is we have a subscription, but we do it yearly. So it's more of like we're contracting out those services to HR downloads. Um, they are our portal for all our online training, which we're using uh, way more now due to COVID. They're actually providing a lot more training that wasn't um, provided before. And we're able to um, provide that to all our staff. Plus there's a lot of other um, things that we use um, with that um, program or, but the training is um, something we can't get rid of because that's where we do most of our legislative training also. Um, advertising also went up, not a lot, um, but for such a small budget, it makes an impact. Um, that's just costing, like we don't control those costs. So when the papers increase their costs or um, where we advertise for positions and things like that. Um, and as you know, it's not always easy to um, hire in Suakot. So sometimes we have to get creative and uh, advertise in places that um, maybe we wouldn't um, usually, or maybe I wouldn't have advertised five years ago. Um, so there's a cost associated with all of that. Um, we were able to reduce travel and training. It seems like a big amount for such a small department, but I think some of the counselors and mayor would know this, but maybe not everyone. Um, HR supports all departments. So um, departments anticipate travel and training for their staff, but sometimes training comes along that wasn't anticipated. And it's usually um, some sort of legislative training or something that um, we're seeing a trend where our staff need that training. Um, and then it's um, kind of housed within the HR budget and um, HR um, implements it to all the departments um, or works with them. And sometimes we have to offset those costs. Um, and then there's also just legislative training that my staff have to take or the staff, sorry, not my staff, the staff within my department have to take. Um, but the nice thing with COVID, if there is anything nice about it is um, like other managers have um, spoken about is the training, we're seeing it online um, quite often, which is um, great. So I was essentially able to take out all the travel and training for um, any of our staff leaving um, the municipality. However, there is still cost of bringing um, trainers in because we're still doing that. Um, Another increase or another reason why travel and training didn't increase, um, let's say to half or less than half would be that we're not able to train as many people at once. Um, so we do still have to do in-person training, um, but there's um, limits. So before we used to be able to cram, let's say 30 people in a room. And now with social distancing, we're, we're very limited with that. And some training has to be done um, hands on. Um, I think that's kind of the major uh, issues or the, the things that um, are happening within HR. Um, Payroll is also housed within HR. Um, and COVID's just brought a whole new world to legislation, to payroll requirements, to um, ESA. Um, so just trying to keep on top of that. Every day is a new day. Every day I get a different employee asking a new question. So trying to anticipate within the budget what that means for maybe speaking to a lawyer about something or um, contracting out some sort of service. Uh, these are, I've, like I've been working here for almost eight years and these are, COVID has brought legal issues that I never dreamt would happen. So um, thankfully, if we go through another pandemic, we'll be a little bit more prepared. So that's all from me. Thank you. I'll go around the table to uh, Councillor Howie. Thank you, uh, Melissa. I don't have any questions. Councillor Timpson. Hey, Melissa, would you mind again going over the issue about wages and benefits? And it's just two of you in the department, I think you said. Um, last year it was 386,000. How many did you have last year and, and this year? You may, have, you may have gone over this, but my, I think my mind was looking at something else at the time. Um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, there's actually three of us, um, myself, the HR administrator and the payroll clerk. 
Um, last year, there was four of us. Um, we had uh, another person within the department who was working on um, bringing forth our health and safety committee. They were in my role um, and then they had to go off and then I came back early from my leave. Um, so they stayed on to help um, get health and safety finished because COVID arose and the department wasn't able to take on both. And we were being, we had to get our health and safety um, committee up and running to new kind of standards due to COVID. Um, so that person had, did a wonderful job and um, has retired. So um, what happened is instead of replacing that person, um, we were able to, um, not just my department, but other departments were able to take on um, that work and kind of divide it up. So I can't take all the credit for that. There's definitely a bunch of us um, taking on those, that role of health and safety. But because we had that one person working on that, um, they were able to, uh, um, you know, get a really good start at it. Um, the other thing too is that that person retired and they were a longtime employee. So you might not have actively seen them here, but they were still an employee for some time. Without okay, saying. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bath. Uh, no questions, uh, no questions for you, Melissa. Thank you very much. Councillor Fenlon. Uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks for the overview, Melissa. Nothing further here. Councillor Lego. Yeah, just uh, one question. Um, do all the job ads come out of your budget? Does that go in the paper? Through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes. Um, once in a while, the daycare will post. Um, because I have limits on how much I can post, right? So if they feel that they needed to post extra, sometimes they will cover those costs, but um, that hasn't happened in a while. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything further, HR? No, thanks for taking it easy on me. All right, thank you. Uh, back to you, Treasurer. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we have the Public Works Department, which includes Municipal Fleet, Project Management, Public Works, Waste Management, and Utilities. So I will pass it along to the Public Works Manager to speak to all those areas. Um, thank you, uh, Treasurer, and uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, <clears throat> budget here, some significant dollars. Um, I'll start at the first is the municipal fleet and uh, that incorporates all the fleets uh, throughout uh, the municipality with the exception of the, the lease car that's at the town office. Um, the savings in this uh, budget are uh, somewhat attributed to um, budgeting less for fuel, um, using historic fuel costs for past budgets and then looking at this savings this year with the decrease in fuel prices and anticipating that uh, there's not gonna be much of an increase uh, going forward into 2021. There's a reduction there. And then uh, with every year, there's certain allocations to certain pieces of equipment that may require larger um, purchases such as tires for a grader or, or um, so on and so forth. And some of that has been uh, removed this year as compared to last year to make up the difference in that. Um, the project management and infrastructure budget uh, is mainly comprised of uh, a portion of my salary and then some other uh, small components that we utilize for asset management and uh, the GIS uh, software. Um, the increases in there are substantial, but uh, not, not, not much to note there. Uh, the public works budget um, actually has a decrease this year and uh, it's uh, somewhat attributed to um, to not uh, doing some uh, some work that we did last year that uh, added some expense to the budget. Um, the one uh, note that's down further in, in terms of fees is the gravel pit is, uh, there's an additional $10,000 in this year to pay the crown uh, for uh, the royalties due on the aggregate we extracted from our aggregate site in order to infill that lot for uh, at the industrial park at the airport where that camp is situated right now. All that aggregate came out of the municipality's pit. So we owe the crown uh, accordingly for um, the royalties on the gravel. 
And uh, that's right now in the public works budget. Um, I'm not, I thought perhaps maybe there was discussion about that, that, that uh, money coming from somewhere else in terms of the development of that property, but I'll have to discuss that with the treasurer again, but right now it needed to be budgeted. So, so that's where it is right now. Um, the, the wages in public works um, fluctuate year to year, depending on where we want to focus uh, some different sorts of maintenance or, or development. So for example, last year, there was more money allocated to roads because public works had a component in the public, in the capital project for the rural roads. Uh, this year we probably allocated we, we have we probably haven't we have we've allocated more wages to ditching because we're going to move forward with some drainage improvements so we can continue on with uh, road upgrades in both Sulacote and Hudson. Uh, the waste management budget um, the most significant increase there is uh, our blue box recycling and uh, with the acquisition of a new, of different type of uh, contractor in terms of uh, not having a destination locally for these materials to be processed. Uh, we have a contractor now collecting from Dryden who's backhauling materials to Dryden where there's a substantial increase in the fees of uh, handling materials there as are forwarded on to Winnipeg. So uh, even though our, um, our revenue or our share of uh, the, uh, the amount that uh, Stewardship Ontario uh, take, uh, receives from the producers to offset the cost of recycling, uh, our increase, uh, but our expenses are still uh, substantial there in terms of last year. So th there's a substantial variance there um, in order to continue to provide that service. Not to get too far off topic, changes are on the way as I'm sure everyone knows the blue box uh, is under the uh, scope, uh, under the new uh, full producer responsible responsibility model, um, which falls under the Resource Recovery and Circular Economy Act, uh, draft legislate Draft legislation is uh, is up for review, and uh, anticipated transition is to start in uh, 2023. So there is some movement there, and then uh, so we're but we'll, we're stuck with these costs here for for a few years moving forward until that transition is complete. And that transition schedule for all of Ontario is uh, up to 2025. So uh, we can spend a lot of time talking about that. I, I don't want to at this point, if you want further information on that, uh, please ask me and I can bring you up to speed on what's going on there. Uh, the utilities budget, it, it's hard to see any variance in there because the revenue that comes in exceeds the expenditure and therefore there's an offset uh, with a transfer to reserves, which essentially uh, creates a zero balance in the budget. Um, the reserve transfers look uh, relatively the same as last year. There's a slight increase every year with the contracted services for Northern Waterworks for the operations of our water and wastewater facilities. Uh, that's an annual increment based on their contract, on the contract that we've negotiated with them. So they're in the final year uh, of their contract this year. So we'll be looking at 2022 for some, um, for some con uh, contract negotiations going on there. And we'll, we'll have to bring it to council and decide what, how council wants to proceed, whether we uh, go back with an RFP for a new service provider or there is the option for a contract extension with NWI for another five years. Um, other than that, uh, the travel and training is minuscule here in this, uh, in the variance here, it's, uh, but the same as every other department, not anticipating to do uh, much of that. So uh, having said that, I, I don't want to get into too much further detail. I'll wait for questions uh, if there are any. Uh, sorry, Mary Lawrence, we can't hear you. It's technical. No. Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry, now we can't. We could for a very brief moment, but then we couldn't. Still nothing, unfortunately.
maybe we should take this opportunity just to move to the next slide. Nice try, Andrew. There you go. Apologies, uh, Council and everybody else. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, apologies. I think we were at uh, Councillor Howie. Uh, he couldn't hear me call his name, and I couldn't hear him. Uh, Councillor Howie, questions for Public Works. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lauren. I, I was a little nervous seeing there first up that you were calling on me and I couldn't hear you. So um, I, I, I don't have any questions for public work. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. Though. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, it's quite clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. Councillor Bath. No, Andrew, you did a good job. I have no questions for you. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, nothing here. Thanks, Andrew. Welcome. Well, I may as well ask one question. <laughs> uh, do. don't, only, only question I have is uh, how, how is allowing uh, um, construction waste at the landfill going? Uh, to you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, there has been a noted uh, increase in revenue from that. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it's going well. Um, in conversation with the landfill attendant, it's noted that uh, there is an increase in uh, in construction waste being brought in. Uh, what we're noticing now, um, not to get too far off topic, but is a, is a substantial increase in use still on Saturdays. So for example, in the last two weekends, uh, we've had over 120 um, customers at the landfill on a Saturday when we've re reduced the winter hours, which means there's only one attendant there. But since then, we've now uh, responded to that and we're sending someone out there for three hours on Saturday to, so the attendant can have a break and to push some garbage back in that. So the landfill is uh, is being utilized here uh, at a rate that's higher than in the past. But uh, the construction waste, it, I think, has been received well and is going well. Yes. And it's adding some some substance to the to the ground itself. It gets pretty soupy in there. So. Uh, yeah, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I agree. Uh, in the past, without any type of waste like that, we were mostly dealing with organics and, uh, and plastics and so on and so forth. And we were adding a lot of material as cover, uh, more probably than needed uh, to essentially try and stay afloat, but yet compact garbage was at a rate where we're not uh, reducing our capacity. So it's been a welcomed uh, addition uh, uh, to, the, to the landfill in terms of revenue and uh, some substance to, to work with there. So, um, I, and uh, you know what, um, quite honestly, I, I haven't really heard anything negative about it. So uh, I'm gonna say it's been a positive, it's been received fairly positively, yes. Thanks, Andrew. You're welcome. Thank you, thanks uh, Public Works. Um, I, I think you'll be getting some questions on capital projects from uh, when they come. Okay, thank you. Treasurer, back to you. Oh. Treasurer? S sorry, quick interruption. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Now we go on to recreation and culture, which includes Cedar Bay culture, parks and gardens, and recreation. And I'll pass it along to the um, rec manager who's currently looking after the site. Hello, everybody. Um, we currently are uh, looking at our memorial arena. Um, we're currently, I would say probably 80% of our uh, user group are using the, the arena right now. Uh, we're missing the Warriors, obviously, and uh, we're also missing the uh, school programs, which 
do quite a bit of uh, our ice time in the, the daytime. Um, other than that, it's business as usual. We have slowed down just a bit uh, since we went to Code Yellow, uh, just because of the transfer of uh, trying to keep people in and out of the building uh, safely without you know, going over our limits. Um, so that's about where that is. Uh, we're not really, um, we're kind of at a standstill as far as uh, advertising goes for the arena. Uh, people want to advertise, but they're not sure that they want to jump in right now because uh, we might get to the next level and they're not sure if the place is going to be open or not. So we do have some interest, uh, but it's kind of uh, slow going right now. Um, as far as the fitness center goes, uh, from October to November, we are pretty much up about 100 people a day on everything like uh, cardio room, weight room, uh, gym use, uh, stay the same, but walking track, everything uh, kind of crept up there. But since we went to Code Yellow, we've seen a, a, a market, a remarkable amount of people deciding to stay away. Uh, part of that is because we had to implement, um, uh, you had to book your, your times to come into the place. You couldn't just uh, walk in and come and go as you pleased anymore. It was uh, basically, so we're in our limits for each uh, space went down. So cardio room is down to five people at a time uh, or four people at a time for cardio, five for weight room and three for our uh, running track room. So that's kind of slowed things down a bit. And uh, I think people are generally a little bit scared once we went to go yellow. So we stayed away from the point. Other than that, uh, we've, go, we've had a little bit of uh, memberships boosting up in November, but they've now we've had a couple of people ask for holds and stuff like that because they are staying away. Um, our travel and training uh, budget, I think we need to keep up our budget, our training for our uh, plant room. It is a certified place where you have to be. Uh, I wouldn't like to leave the next manager that's going to be here without a chance to uh, Keep people in training if uh, things do open up. The certification for the plant room is a, a huge cost uh, because you're paying you're paying for a uh, hotel room for five five days, airfare to go down to Southern Ontario, and of course the course itself. So it, for one or two people, it is a huge amount of money. Uh, we have uh, regular things like chainsaw training and uh, first aid training and stuff like that that we need to do as well. So uh, that's about it. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Councillor Holly. Thank you uh, for that, that uh, presentation. I did have some questions um, regarding first uh, with with Cedar Bay. Um, are we? Yeah. Okay. With Cedar Bay, um, the specific question I had around that um, was the. the I see there's contracted services um, under the riding stables uh, for a thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollar reduction um, from the year, but is that through uh, what, the, what the clerk had mentioned earlier with um, with transfer um, for for snow removal from other departments of the municipality? Is that what we're looking at there? Um, just my first question in that department. I, I can answer this if you want. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had a hard time hearing so in regards to the riding stables, typically every year we set aside roughly $2,000 for any sort of maintenance or contracted work that we need to do to the actual site um, up at the top. What we've done this year for the 2021 budget is we have went in and we've looked at the last five years to see how much uh, we've actually expensed uh, in that line and noticed that um, not one year or the last uh, five years we exceed the $1,000. Um, so what we decided to do for the 2021 budget is to knock it down to 1000 and see what happens um, moving forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question I had was surrounding um, the comparison in wages and benefits between the Cedar Bay Day Camp and the Stewardship Youth Ranger Program, understanding that the, the SYR program is, is funded through an agreement 
uh, with the provincial government um, and is, is about $38,000, I believe. Uh, however, the Cedar Bay wages and benefits it sits around uh, $77,000 uh, projected. So is that factoring in a percentage of the wages for the assistant uh, manager as well as the uh, full-time recreation and culture manager? That is correct. So the same thing with other departments, it uh, takes into increases, uh, the unions increase and also the management and the assistant management increases and it's divided out within uh, the whole entire recreation and culture uh, operations. Um, so which is why you see uh, increase within Cedar Bay, but nothing to do with uh, the ranger program because a ranger program is 100% funded it doesn't cost the municipality any sort of extra fees so those wages and stuff have no um we hire additional staff in the summertime specifically for that program okay thank you and my last question uh, relates to the thirteen thousand um, dollars under contracted services for the umferville trail is that uh, to acknowledge the much needed repairs of the trail in this upcoming year? The Umberfield um, Trail, what we do is every year is we send out an RFP for the plowing of it throughout the winter um, months. And we contract that out. Um, and that's what that amount pays for, is for the contracting of that trail. I believe it starts in November and it goes until April. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to clarify in this budget, there is no uh, item for repairs to the trail. Uh, the CAO has a comment, uh, Treasurer of Chimay. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, that 13,000 does include a bit of money for repairs and maintenance because the contract for the snow removal of the Umferville Trail does not come up to 13,000. I believe that it was contracted out. We just signed the contract in and around um, um, $8,000 this year. So there, the difference would be for upkeep and maintenance. Thank you. Just to be clear, I'm sure that, that $5,000 difference is not for major upgrade uh, or redo. No. That's, it's, it's minor, minor upgrade and maintenance. Correct. Okay, yeah, th there is um, some deterioration in areas that I, I don't believe it needs an overhaul. I'm just in the swampy areas. There's some some cracks and some um, give in, in the trail where, where vehicles have, have driven on it. Um, thank you. I'd leave it to the public works manager or somebody, but I, I, that trail is is about thirty years old. It does need a, a major a major overhaul, and five thousand dollars ain't going to cover it. I'll tell you that we're we're talking about tens of thousands for sure. The yeah, idea, if I may, your yeah, you may. And um, I'm going to go back to my desk, Councillor Cassidy. If I disappear as deputy mayor, acting deputy mayor, you have the chair for a moment until you see me active again. I can just comment on that, uh, Councillor Howie. Um, what we're doing is uh, right now we're we're going to see. Hopefully, some funding will come up for that type of program to upgrade uh, the trail, and then we're going to at the same time we're going to look at what it's going to cost so that we're ready if an application for funding comes up or a funding stream comes up to be able to apply for it. Okay, thank you. And uh, just one last question that I, I just remembered. The item of insurance under the Cedar Bay riding stables, is that uh, through an agreement with the Friends of Cedar Bay to cover any kind of activities that they're holding there at the riding stables? Um, and is that kind of a, a donation or agreement? Are, are you speaking specifically to the request in the budget this evening? No. no um, well, I, I see there is an item for dollars. Uh, under the Cedar Bay riding stables, insurance, $800. That insurance is an allocation through our whole insurance program because the buildings actually are owned by the municipality and we have liability insurance on the property as well because they're leasing it. So we have our own liability insurance and they have their own liability insurance and coverage for the stables itself and their operations. Okay. 
Uh, I just wanted to clarify, I thought that maybe some kind of uh, agreement to or, or cover under municipal liability insurance for their activities. Not, Thank you. not, not the stables, no. Thanks, Councillor Cassidy. That's, that's it, Councillor Howie? For now, yes. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. A yeah, question about the Cedar Bay Day Camp, um, which didn't run. Um, so I wonder if you could explain the the revenue for the, the, the day camp, which we didn't get, and um, expenditures, which we really only had it. We, we didn't have any expenditures, 77,000. That was budgeted, but we didn't get that. But, what will happen to that? That we must have a surplus from the Cedar Bay, do we not? Okay, well, the day camp. We didn't operate the day camp this year because of uh, COVID, so there was no surplus or there was no revenues or expenses. So the pro the program was neutral. Yeah, it, it, but it shows that as if it shows a thirteen thousand dollar. Our costs, but it was neutral. Yeah, I, I just don't understand the way it's um, the way it's presented. It, why would it cost us thirteen thousand when it didn't happen? I guess, or, or did it? No, it didn't. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Timson, what page is that on? Sorry. On uh, page uh, two of thirty-four. Or why is it? Yeah. Two of thirty-four. Page two of thirty-four. Oh, you're looking at the. Are you looking at the hard copy? Yeah, the hard. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. I do, I'm just not clear on how it how it's presented here. It, it's it's confusing. Uh, Cedar Bay. Yeah. Isn't that the difference between uh, revenues expected from this year and what we got, or I guess the year before? This should have been. I, I, I can answer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so what we're kind of anticipating, but we're not 100% sure in regards to Cedar Bay in uh, registration was in 2020, we had budgeted $25,000 in revenue, um, not knowing that COVID was gonna hit, knowing that we are still in the situation that we are and we, we're not 100% sure what uh, the new rules are going to be in regards to next summer if the rules remain the same where you can only have X amount of kids per um, uh, camper uh, counselor there we would have to our revenue would be down but the staff would the amount of staff would still remain the same so that's why you see that there's a difference of the 13,000 as a loss in revenue because we're not entirely sure what those protocols are going to be in regards to next summer but um, if the protocols remain the same as it does with daycare where you only have x amount of kids per counselor then we need to keep the counselors the amount of counselors that we currently have but there would be a little bit of a loss of revenue due to the fact that we wouldn't be able to bring in as many kids as we used to in the, in the past. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess my question is too, they, um, there was, we budgeted a certain amount, it didn't happen. So what happened to the money that we budgeted for? Did it go in, is it just gone into another, another line or is it surplus? Dr. Timson, if I may, uh, uh, Treasurer, if you just go down a uh, line to the expenditure, Cedar Bay Day Camp uh, expenditure, equipment costs, supplies, wages, and benefits. So in 2020, there were wages and benefits of 77000 for 2020. I, I, can you answer the, that would be, I think what Councilor Timson is looking at. I'm not sure. Is it, uh, yeah, that's, what I, that's what I'm looking at, yeah. But there were no staff to pay 77000 too, and what happened? to the money, I guess. <laughs> so I, you, Worship, I'm not sure if Carly's going to answer it or me, so that's why I'm hesitating. Sorry, go ahead. 
I'm doing the same. Um, uh, so in regards to the wages and benefits for Cedar Bay, usually what we do is we hire summer students um, in the summertime specifically for Cedar Bay. In 2020, we didn't do that. So, you, so, no, I just wonder what happened to the, the $77,000 that was budgeted for it. That's my question. So where did it go? I can add to that, uh, uh, Carly. Um, so in the budget, if you look, there was a net deficit in 20, uh, like, sorry, a net, um, um, a net expenditure of projected of 53,697, the difference between the projected revenues and the expenses. So that 53,000, we would have levied through taxation. So that becomes part of our general surplus if we have one, but council has to be cognizant of the fact that we did lose a lot of money in 2020 in uh, loss of revenues and where some of our expenditures were unavoidable that we still had to uh, incur those expenditures. So we're hopeful that we're going to end up in a surplus position, but normally that would become part of our surplus, our overall surplus at year end. I think that's what you're asking, Councillor Timson. Uh, thank you, yes, thank you. It's a budget, budgeted expenditure that didn't happen and became part of the surplus or the overall went in as a surplus, but uh, helps to reduce the deficit probably. Thank you, Councillor Bath. Oh yeah, just a, a quick question for Rich probably is uh, in, for the Memorial Arena, how many certified plant operators do we have? Uh, actually right now, uh, We'll have five of them, uh, but they're not like uh, there's different degrees, like different levels of certification. Um, so it's important to keep it up. And uh, like we have one young guy there that's uh, uh, he's a casual, but he is certified uh, in the first degree. I guess you should say. Your, and, your uh, audio is, is your audio is rather um, blurry. Can can you can you improve it at all? Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I have to stare right at the microphone. Um, we have, like everybody, uh, every full-time person is uh, certified to a certain degree. Um, each of them are, have a little bit more than, you know, uh, the next guy, the longer they're here, the more training they get. Uh, we do have one casual that is certified in the first degree, I guess you could say. Um, and that just gives him more uh, level of uh, training in the plant room uh, where he can be on his own a little bit more. Uh, the other guys, I think uh, three of them are fully trained and we need probably uh, two more to be fully on their own. Okay, yeah, that, I just wasn't sure what, what we had there. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Fanlin. Uh, I have no comment on it. Councilor Cassidy. Oh, that, thanks for that, Rich. I, I don't have much further. Just one question. Um, the Umfervale, the, the man bridge that crosses Pelican Creek there, is that, if that was to get painted, would that be something that could be done in house or would that have to be, we'd have to, would we have to bring in a special contractor to paint that? Um, that would probably be a facilities thing. I know that, uh, uh, quite a while ago, they did redo it. Somebody came in. Uh, uh, we had to get a contractor, and they uh, put stuff in the creek and sandblasted it and repainted it. And that was quite a while ago. That was 15 years ago, maybe more. I was just wondering. It looks like it could use a facelift, and I was wondering if that was something that uh, would have to be a capital or if something that could be done in house. But. It, uh, speaking from a facility point of view, we probably could try it. I don't know how long it lasts. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be leery about doing it over top of the creek, though, a little bit, just to, if it peeled off and went into the creek. Yeah, that's that's the that's that was kind of when my quite question was if it was within our within our skill set or whatnot to to do that on our own or not. So yeah, um, yeah. I could, uh, as far as facilities goes, I could probably look into it. Uh, I know sometimes it's. it's Gets pretty scratched up with the kids carving the names in it and stuff. Yeah, that would be that'd be good. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Lego. 
Yeah, uh, just a question on the boat launches. Um, I'm not sure if we have to wait for the audit, but the revenue and expenses for 2020, I don't know if you have them on hand, Treasurer. Like, did we make what we thought we were going to make at the $40,800? And did we spend this 66000 Um, I don't have that information uh, currently on hand. Our software is currently down um, or else I'd be able to get that to you right away. But once our software gets up and going, I will make sure to put that information to you together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's uh, recreation. Anything further? All right, back to you, Treasurer. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So now we're into the Treasury Department, which is uh, my department. So my main focus is going to be on the Treasury, not the taxation. The taxation is going to be discussed at a later part of the presentation. So within this budget, there's an increase of 31 to 37. What has, what has and is occurring uh, within this budget is contracted services. So in 2021, we have uh, two plans that are legislated that we have to do. Um, one of them being the water and sewer financial plan that has to be done um, by August and submitted to council for approval that year. That plan is a 10 year plan that we will be putting together with a contractor and it has to be submitted to the government every five years. So this, um, in 2021, this plan has come up for a renewal, which is legislated to do. The other project that, uh, or I should say plan that needs to be done is the asset management plan that's legislated to be completed in July of 2021 municipalities had pulled together um, in 2020 to, to ask for an extension on that plan as to due to COVID. Um, municipalities are having a hard time putting everything together to um, meet that deadline. Um, we are working very hard and, and we are trying to do our due diligence in to get that plan in uh, for July of this year. Hence us having to hire a contractor to do our building condition assessments on all of our buildings. And we've been working with our software company to launch um, easier ways and easier things to access within our software. Those are the two biggest things that I have that's occurring within this um, department for next year that is legislated and we cannot change or cannot push to another year. The other thing that is uncontrolled for with what is occurring is we have a software increase. So we've been informed that our software is, uh, the rate is going up in 2021. So our current rate plus all the additions that we put in place in 2020, the finance department has um, started to do a lot of projects in regards to making things more accessible for the public. In 2021, we will be launching what's called Virtual City Hall, which is kind of like if anybody logs in onto their Sioux Hydro account where you can see your account, you can see all your payments, you can see what's going on in every month. The same thing is going to be occurring in finance in regards to virtual city hall. This software is purchased already and will be launched in uh, 2021. With that, um, uh, customers will be able to log in. They'll be able to see all their taxes. They'll be able to see their assessments, their payments. Same thing with water and sewer. They'll be able to log in. They'll be able to see what their water and sewer bill is every month, every single payment that has gone on, when those payments have occurred and everything else. Because of that, what I've tried to do is knowing, be, knowing that those increases are occurring, I've tried to cut back in other areas. 
I've cut a lot in travel and training. The tr travel and training that is currently in the budget is specifically for new staff that has been hired to get them trained on uh, software that we currently have that they'll need uh, training to help launch all these new projects. The other thing that has occurred also is there's been a little bit of change with wages and benefits and that's due to also staff changes. Everything else that falls within this budget is uncontrollable. So we have the payments from Kenora um, Home for the Age. We have the Northwestern Health Unit. We have the policing costs. We have, um, I believe Councillor Cassidy asked in regards to donations that are passed through the bylaws. Those all flow through this department. As you'll see, there's a line item for all three of them. Hence the, um, the Handy Transit, the Salvation Army, along with uh, the Senior Center also is located within this budget. We, for the most part, we don't know what our current uh, increases are to the uncontrollable costs. So what I've done is I've gone into the budget and I've, I've increased them by 1.5% in hopes that they come back to us stating that the cost for 2021 will be the same as it is for 2020, as it was for 2020. However, on the safe side, I always budget in advance for a 1.5% increase in regards to that. There is one thing that was brought to my attention this morning that is not included in this budget that I want to make council aware of is we received the 2021 insurance um, in costs. Um, throughout this year, I've been hearing across the board from other municipalities that their insurance has gone up as much as 26% um, rolling into the new year. I, we have done some, uh, cut some equipment out of our insurance because they are no longer on the road. And we've also haven't, um, we've lost some land because of land sales. So that comes off. So you might see a little bit of variance in regards to what is in the insurance. I did budget a little bit of an increase, but however, the increase that was brought to me this morning is not in the current budget. We were shown today that we will have a $31,000 increase in our insurance overall for the municipality. So I just wanna make council aware that that will be placed into the next round of budget as it was just brought to my attention this morning in regards to that. Um, everything else has kind of remained the same in regards to it. I've tried to make it as close as possible so that the increase would only kind of show what uh, the two plans were that we had to launch um, next year. And um, that's, that's everything with this budget. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Treasurer. Councilor Howard. Thank you, uh, Treasurer, for your presentation. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank, I mean, taking time to um, really like the, the notice to production and policing costs. Do, do we have an idea as to why that, that attribution is? The CAO may know more about uh, how the policing costs are put together. I should probably be referring that to the mayor because he's uh, he's he's been tracking the statistics and uh, we've been meeting with the solicitor general over our policing costs for some time and minister and uh, um, in in person and uh, through our uh, AMO and uh, Roma delegations. But uh, perhaps the mayor may, may want to comment on that specifically. Sure, the, the policing costs are. Uh... The, the cost you see is actually the four year average and it doesn't include last year's policing. So it goes back something like 2016, 17, 18, 19. Uh, then 2020 would factor into the year after this. So they, they give us the cost based on that four year average. Um, and that's it. That's the way the, that's done all OPP uh, across the, the province. That's, they were set to change the, the, the financial model uh, starting this year, but because of COVID and other things, that 
I believe he's going to be deferred one more year, not certain yet. Our plus discount after that calculation is done is then applied to, to whatever number they come up with. So sometimes, some years, even though your policing costs have gone down the year before, or your policing costs for service have gone down, your costs may go up depending on the agglomeration of the four years that are taken into account to give you that. But I think they did that to, to they were trying to level off the cost for communities across the province uh, in, in each community. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lawrence. It does just um, for members of the public that would be viewing this, they may attribute that to a lesser uh, number of calls for service. But thank you for, for explaining the process. It could be lesser, it could be more last year, but, uh, and the cost doesn't necessarily reflect, reflect that at all. It over the long haul, it would, but uh, not in the short term. Councillor Simpson. Uh, not too many questions. Um, is the uh, CEO of the library here to make a presentation? Because I see the li the library is uh, included here. That's on the agenda. Uh, yeah. You have Councillor Simpson coming up after this. Okay. Otherwise, I have no, I have no questions. Yeah, uh, thanks, Carly, for bringing up that uh, bit about the insurance. I found out about it yesterday, and I was just looking for a chance to bring it up. I was noticing all through our budgets it hasn't changed from year to year, and uh, in, in all, all of the management budgets, and I know it has. And now that you brought up the point, it is going to be a big in increase. So we definitely need to be aware of that. Thanks for that. Well, not thanks for that, but thanks for your presentation. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I have no comment on it. Thank you. Councilor Cassidy. Thanks for that, Carly. Um, off the top of your head, roughly what percentage is that? I know you said other municipalities have had 26%. What uh, what percentage is the thirty one thousand for our municipality? Um, I didn't look. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, I think I think but I believe it's somewhere around the the twelve to thirteen uh, percent mark. Okay, oh, that's good. Thank you. No further questions. Councillor Lego. No, I'm good. Thanks, Carly. Thank you. I just have a question, a couple of small things. The um, Sen Sioux Seniors Activity Center, I thought there was a change in the way that was going to be funded this year. Am I wrong? I thought, I thought the province had created some, some, some change that made a change here, no? So our, our portion is um, in the past, the municipality used to work with them to receive their funding. And then what we what was decided last year was that every year within the bylaw, the municipality would give X amount of dollars to the senior center to help them operate um, and manage for snow clearing for um, their day-to-day -day operations at the senior center. And they're gonna use that money to help leverage additional funding that they can uh, receive. Other than that, um, I'm not entirely sure what is occurring with the senior centers and, and new legislation that has come out. Okay. That's fine, thank you. Okay. I have nothing further. Anything further, uh, Treasurer, the Treasurer's Department? Okay, nothing. So back to you, Treasurer. Sorry, I see Councillor Kempson got a question. Yeah, I was just I was just looking at the no, I think I found it. Um, uh, yeah. Back to you, Treasurer. Oh, okay. Um, that's all I have. Next up, we have the Sulaco Public Library who will be discussing their um, budget and I will pass it on over to Mike. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yes. 
Okay, uh, through your Mayor Lawrence, I would like to do two things. I'd like to provide some uh, further context. I'd like to thank the uh, the treasurer for putting this slide together. Um, I'd just like to provide some further context for our transfer for 2021, our, our requested transfer, and just give you a brief snapshot of what's happened at the library the past few months, our current operations, and what we're doing moving forward. So I had some great discussions with the CIO and the treasurer the past few months on what the library was doing in terms of our closures, what our budgets, what our budget was looking like for the remainder of 2020. And we've been doing some forecasting. So the situation is we are forecasting a sizable surplus at the end of 2020. And that is mostly due to a, uh, a funding decrease in wages and benefits. And there's also been, we've also underspent on wages and benefits the past uh, few years, uh, going back to uh, 2017. Uh, a lot of it has to do with staff members leaving positions, new staff members coming in uh, under the pay grid. Um, so in a sense, we have, um, we, we've underspent on wages for several years and we have accumulated a, a sizable surplus. And that's what we're going to be using in 2021. So even though we asked for 348 last year and we're asking for 300, on paper it looks like we're being reduced in funding, but in reality there's a very real, you know, amount of money that's already been given to us by the municipality that's, you know, um, sitting in our operational account, which we will use in in 2021. Um, yeah, um, just seeing where I am in my notes here. I'd like to uh, thank, thank the council and, and the taxpayers of Sulacout for, for giving us about 90% of our operating money for, for revenue. So that's great to see. We generate about 10% through government grants, uh, additional grants and generous donations from the community. So people pay for the library with their property taxes and a lot of library patrons donate a lot of money to the library and we're very grateful for that. We, we feel supported and we look forward to bringing great service to the community. I want to acknowledge all the staff who work at the library, who've worked together with me um, to figure out how to, how to run a library when you're closed, how to, how to do it when you reopen. I'd like to acknowledge the work that our board does. We have nine active volunteers who, who comprise our, our, our library board. They've been busy working on a strategic plan uh, it needs to be updated. The final version is, is nearing completion. And I've been given direction from my board to forge better links between the library and community organizations. To that effect, we hired our first community engagement librarian in March of 2020. It was formerly called the assistant slash children's librarian. Unfortunately, as soon as we hired her, COVID hit and it was very hard for her to engage with the community, but things are changing. Uh, one of the things, her and I worked on was securing a grant to produce an archive that will deal with the history of the Pelican Falls Indian residential school system. So we're, we're really uh, thrilled to be working on a project of that, of that nature. We're just doing the planning for it. We're going to be reaching out to the community shortly to get, you know, more feedback and more information about that program. Um, so the library is currently open 36 hours a week. This time last year it was 52. Um, but that being said, the senior staff at the library are quite busy behind the scenes doing lots of admin work. We're looking ahead to next year where we would like to do um, a program called the Big Community Read, where we pick one book by one author. And we're going to try and get as many people reading it in Sulacout and Lac Sewell uh, as possible. And we're, we're trying to find a really big name author, um, even someone like Eden Robinson is quite doable if it's just a virtual reading. So we're kind of shooting for the stars on that one, trying to get a really big notable Canadian author um, and get as many people in Sioux and Lac Sioux reading that book and getting people excited about reading and finding ways to connect with our community digitally um, and looking at service delivery that's um, not always dependent on you being physically in the building. Um, yeah, I think that's, all I wanted to cover. I just want, I want, I really wanted to clarify our transfer for 2021. 
and just make everyone aware that the library is in fact open. I get that question every day. As the every every time I see someone on the street, they ask me if I'm open. But uh, we are most definitely open. We're not. We, we, our circulation is getting back to where it used to be. Obviously, foot traffic is way down, but things are slowly going back to normal. And every month, our numbers inch. You know, they 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 move closer to what they used to be. All right, thank you. I'll go around for questions, Councilor Hummy. Thank you, uh, Michael, for that uh, presentation. And thank you for noting the uh, reduction in, in requested funding for, for 2021. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing the progress that the library makes, um, especially in the, the noted project with the uh, Pelican Falls Residential School archiving. But, uh, no questions, thank you. Councillor Yeah, my, my concern, only concern here uh, is the depletion of that reserve, um, taking the, you know, the whole 48,000 out of a reserve. How much would we, would we be have, would we have left there um, if we, if we take that out of reserve, Mike? Uh, I, I think if uh, at the end of the day, um, well, actually by the end of 2021, we should be in a situation where there's about 15 to 20,000 additional dollars in our bank account, in our operating account than we need to operate. So it's, it's a nice buffer. There's also a 20, I believe a $25,000 overdraft if we ha ever needed to use it. But um, so I think by the end of 2021, we'll get back to, and, and that's what typically was the practice at the library. You, you would see the operational account would have an, an additional 10 to 15,000, depending on where you were in the year and how much you had paid for. The municipality of Silico issues us uh, four checks every year that it's our transfer divided by four. So as the administrator, I, I just monitor that and make sure there will be enough in the account. Um, but right now there is a, a significant surplus in that operating account that um, through my meetings with the treasurer and the CAO, um, we were all in agreement that that was probably the best course of action for 2021. And the library can contribute to an overall push to keep expenses down, keep operating expenses to a minimum, but still allow the, the library to operate. And, and then we, and then of course we'd reevaluate for 2022 and, and see how 2021 goes and see how much we can be open and see how much things change in, in the months to come. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's, uh, that's commendable that you were to find you were able to cut that 48,000. I think that's I think that's really, really commendable to see that. Uh, I've been really using ebooks lately since we have been in COVID and I didn't know much how, how much I would like them. And now I'm never gonna go back to reading a hard book, I don't think. It's amazing. When I looked at the numbers, how they've increased from 2019 to 2020, I was going to ask you that question, but you already have it in the report. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm surprised it isn't up higher, but thanks for your, uh, your uh, presentation, Mike. Thank you. Councillor Fallon. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, encouraging to see that we got uh, something going on with the library and the uh, Residents are taking uh, on the working on uh, turning out at the library. Good, good job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation, Mike. It's definitely appreciated to see the way that you've uh, you manage your surplus with with this and and the way you are running the library. It's it's really great. You know, my daughter was in there the other night and asked if she could be loud and she was told yes. So <laughs> good. very progressive. So <laughs> thank good you. Here. Yeah. Unlike Councillor Bath, I like to have a book in my hand. <laughs> um, which is good for the library because once I'm done with the book, they go to the library. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and also I just uh Thanks again, Mike, for this presentation. And I believe that the uh, library is an essential part of our community. So keep up the good work, sir. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Michael. I would echo all those comments. And just to ask it for clarity, this is coming from the library's reserve or not the municipal reserve? Or is it a municipal Yeah, no, reserve? this 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 would be coming just from the 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 library's um we, we maintain we maintain two bank accounts. They're 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 maintained by the municipality of Silico, but they're in our name. Uh, we have an operating account and we have a savings account, which which functions like uh, it's so at, at the end of this year, we will transfer a large sum of money into the reserve account. Uh, I was advised by the treasurer to put a resolution. So my, my board will authorize that at our board meeting on Tuesday. So we'll transfer a large amount into that reserve account. And, that, and, then, and then when 2021 starts, that money comes out and then hopefully by the end of 2021, the sizable surplus in the operating account gets reduced. And, and then it, it, it helps to make our, our transfer a little more manageable from the municipality's point of view. So your board has already approved this? Uh... They hopefully will on Tuesday. We Our board meeting is on Tuesday the 15th and we're gonna have a resolution on the table that will authorize the transfer of a large sum of money. Thank you. Anything further, uh, Mike, to wrap up here? Yeah, uh, just briefly, I want to mention that we're, um, um, li like a lot of departments, uh, looking for revenue that's outside of the uh, municipality. So we're very grateful for the, the contribution we get, but we, we are, we're trying to find revenue elsewhere. Just applied for a Trillium Foundation grant. Um, trying to find a way, we, we have so many used books, um, and, and, and people in Sulaco give us uh, a staggering amount of donations and there's so, and there's so many good books. So um, we're trying to find ways. One thing I'm looking at is trying to sell them online. So I'm trying to, trying to be progressive and find a way the library can generate revenue. And I think this, this community has got a lot of readers and maybe not all of them have library cards necessarily, but they are readers. And when they're done with their books, they come to us. So um, just want to say thanks to the people in Sulaco, keep the donations coming. And yeah, we're just trying to find ways to keep people reading, whether it's our books or whether it's uh, just putting a used book in someone's hand. We're trying to just trying to encourage that habit. So, thank you. Good, uh, treasurer. Back to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, th through you, Mayor Lawrence, I don't know if you want to take a quick five minute break before we head into capital and reserves for your thoughts. Certainly. We'll take a five minute break. I can hear that. I can hear that that's a, a strong suggestion. <laughs> five, five minutes, folks. Thank you. I don't see the clerk, do I? I guess we can, oh, there you are. All set, here I am, I'm good, thanks. You're okay, treasurer, you're up again. Okay, through you, Mayor Lawrence, we are moving into part two of this budget presentation. So as everyone is fully aware, we took a different approach this year in regards to um, uh, capital projects. What we did is we broke out uh, the capital projects into two uh, different areas. The 2020 capital bro projects brought forward into 2021. So these are projects that council has already approved and that are in the works, but aren't fully completed yet and will be completed either in 2021 or in uh, future years. The next part is the 2021 new capital projects. So this is everything new that uh, the management team is requesting from council. With that also, we provided um, capital justification information to all councillors in regards to every single capital item, both uh, in the queue moving forward and currently new requesting requests in for 2021. Um, so that being said, we're going to move into the airport department. So the airport department has multiple projects that are being brought forward into 2021 that have already been approved by council. 
along with that, we have uh, one new project that's being requested from the airport manager in the 2021 budget. Because council has received justification uh, information on all these projects, our question to council is, do you have any questions? All right, so this is the half-ton truck replacement uh, for the airport? Correct. Uh, Councillor Howard. I don't have any questions, thank you. Councillor Kinson. No, I think it's all clear. Councillor Ben. I'm good. Councillor Fenley. Uh, no comment on it. Councillor Cassidy. No, nothing. Councillor Lagos. No, it looks good. Treasurer, back to you. Thank you very much. And moving forward, we are on to corporate services. So the corporate service department for capital projects has a couple of projects that are being brought forward into 2021 and they are requesting no new uh, expenditures for 2020 uh, for the 2021 budget. Everything has um, is currently either started or in the process of being started um, in regards to uh, that department and uh, his request for capital uh, projects rolling forward. My question to council is, do you have any questions? And this would be, sorry, corporate services for the already approved project. Correct. And what would be the nature of the questions here, sorry, treasurer, these are already approved and moving forward. Uh, sometimes uh, council has questions in regards to why the projects haven't been completed in 2020 while they're moving forward. If there's any sort of cost changes, cost change difference requests, uh, items such as that. All right, so there are no cost change requests, but I'll, I'll go around the table and check. Councilor Helm. I don't have any uh, questions for corporate services. Thank you. Councilor Kempson. Uh, yeah, just, just clarifying, all four of these were approved last year, correct? Correct. The money is in is in reserves. Uh, the money, every capital project has revenue coming from different locations. So, in regards to the uh, number one, it's coming from long term debt. So we take that long term debt out after the project has been completed. So we know the true expenses of the project. Uh, capital project number two and three that's on the slideshow right here is all coming from one time funding which has uh, been approved. And in regards to number four, we used uh, taxation dollars to pay for this. So that taxation dollars will be rolled over into 2021. So there's no additional taxation dollars needed in 2021 to pay for item number four. Councilor Timpson, that's it. I'm uh, sure you were talking here on mute. All right. Um, the uh, municipal website enhancement electronic development records was that was in 2020 budget, right? Am I correct on that? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Fanning. Sorry. Councilor Fanning. Uh, no, I have no questions at this time. Councillor Cassidy. Nope, nothing here. Councillor Lego. No, it was answered number four, so I got my answer. Thank you, Treasurer. Thank you, Treasurer. Did I ask you, sorry, Councillor Bass, did I miss you? You sure did. <laughs> Apologies. Questions? No, I'm good. Thank you, Treasurer. Thank you. Now we roll over into emergency services. All of the capital projects that was budgeted for in 2020 have all been completed. So we have some additional projects 
new projects that are being requested in the 2021 uh, uh, capital projects in the in that budget. Um, those two have are included on the justification form as to why they feel it is needed. Does Council have any questions? There we go. Uh, yes, one question uh, regarding the upgrading of the fill station uh, at $32,000. Um, is that that or sorry that's to put in a unit at both the Sulacote uh, fire hall as well as the Hudson fire hall. Um, is there potential for cost savings uh, with a portable unit or would that piece of equipment uh, exceed the price point. I will pass that along to the manager of that department. Yeah, thank you through you Mayor Lawrence. <clears throat> it's a uh, there is a fill station there already. What it is is to contain the bottles. Right now, the way the bottles are filled up, they're just laid on the, on the floor or on a, on a platform, and they need to be contained in a explosion-proof um, apparatus. So as you're filling it up, and if there is a catastrophic failure of the, the cylinder, you'll be all contained within that unit. So there would be one required in Hudson, one in Sulaco. Okay, thank you. Councillor Tensis. No, no questions, thank you. Councillor Matt. No questions. Councillor Fallon. Uh, no questions at this time. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, just with these stations, these are these are, um, I guess, from what you just said, these are additional safety um, upgrades for them. Are what's the life expectancy of these stations? Are and like, are they are they good for the foreseeable future? Are they a little dated? And if if not, will the upgrades that we're putting into it be transferable if there's new stations required? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I don't have any kind of life expectancy, but uh, the fill stations that we have here that, that actually fill the bottles versus what where you where you would place them to fill them, I would imagine there'd be at least ten to twenty years. They wouldn't expire anytime soon. They would they will just age out as you know, like as they pieces wear out. But I'm guessing ten to twenty years. That's all for me. Thank you. Councilor Legal. Yeah, just if um, Robert can find out uh, if there's an expiration date on on these uh, fill station units for the for the next meeting, I'd appreciate that. Just so we have a clear clear idea. I could do that. Thank you. Just uh, further on uh, Councilor Cassidy's question. Any consideration to if, if they have it sounds like they have a 10 year lifespan, why not take a loan and, and uh, pay that over 10 years because they, they'll be value, they'll be a value to uh, for 10 years like that to be used rather than one hit in one financial year. I could I could look into that. I'm just, just curious, it's a $32,000 tax. Estimated tax levy hit, and like when we pay for roads, they're going to be around for 10 or 15 years. We have, you know, there's a loan usually associated with that that goes over the life of the road or the piece of pipe in the ground. Why not pieces of equipment like this? Or just a thought, yeah. Thank you. Um, Treasurer, back to you. Thank you. Next, we have development services. So they have eight projects that are being brought forward into 2021. As you can see, a lot of these projects were either on uh, placed on hold or are um, the construction has already started in regards to them. 
does council have any questions only in regards to the eight items that are shown specifically on this screen? Uh, just for clarity, you call them development services in the, which ones are you referring to in the? So this is for the 2020 capital projects brought forward. I believe on the sheet, sorry, it's called facilities. Facilities, thank you. Um, so these are carried forward, projects already approved and uh, moving on. Council, Howie. Yes, uh, I have a question regarding the waterfront development. There was cited or, or noted delays uh, in the project. If you could expand on, on the specifics of those delays, uh, understanding COVID, but um, more specifically, which um, supply chain, uh, cross-border movements. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, supply chain has been a significant uh, uh, issue getting materials to the site, as well as there's uh, just working with the uh, with KGS or doing the um, you know the site mitigation for the contamination, uh, kind of during the same time, just so they can utilize you know while the ground is open in essence, and uh, as well some of the uh, shop drawings for the steel work. They've I guess they've had some real issues getting getting uh, getting these shop drawings back in order to be able to move forward with the actual construction of the buildings. The uh, the boardwalk is moving along, you know, it's moving along well. Uh, the building should be getting started hopefully within the next week or so. Uh, there's definitely been some delays, but we we're hoping for substantial in sometime mid to late February, although I'm thinking that might push into March. Thank you. Councillor Timpson. Squash court again, that, came, that comes up every year. Um, can we say more about that? Can we have a little bit more information about the squash court? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, that, this is the first year this one's been up, uh, or sorry, last year, uh, it was a request of uh, the rec department. They want to convert the space into programming space because they find for squash user groups, uh, one, one court would be enough to support the squash, squash users. Uh, so the idea here was to turn it into a space for spin class or different things. And just because of COVID and whatnot this year, they decided that we, they would hold off until they can kind of reopen as per normal. So it's just to upgrade the space to support a use like that. I guess, I mean, has there been some assessment that it will be used? It, you know, it's, it's a fair bit of money to put in. Um, for no, this is more, it's, these are already approved projects that you're looking at here. And through you, Mayor Lord, 6,500 of that, I believe, is, uh, is staff wages. So a lot of the work can be done by our facility staff. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I'm not sure the rec department is the one who was was asking for this to happen. I, it sounds like there is interest in it. It's just a matter of getting a space set up for it. Councilor Bath? Yeah, I just don't know a question on uh, line 15, the generator. Uh, I noticed we had in 2020, I think the original budget was 65,000 bucks and now it's, we've reduced it down to 50. I'm curious, I know, I think I saw a report last, or this summer or whatever, in the past anyway, that it had come in over budget. So I, and when I see the budget reduced, and the other question to de deal with that is, is how large is this generator going to be? Is it going to run the whole building or just the, uh, the uh, computer portion of the building? Uh, for you, Mayor Lawrence, the original intent was to have for the municipal office full operational backup and that costing we had some, uh, we had uh, some designs done for, you know, the installation of the generators as well as some construction specs done and the cost was, uh, it was, it was well above what we had budgeted. So some of the money went to the design cost. 
But uh, so we've been working with the engineers over the last year to reduce those costs. And the intent now is for the library uh, municipal offices to just uh, supply backup power to our servers to ensure they stay in continuous operation and to provide full backup power to the airport admin building. And part of that process to reduce costs there is there's two very large electric furnaces in that building. So we're gonna, uh, we're basically not gonna power those up, but, and utilize kind of space heaters if, if the need arises over at the airport admin building, just in order to, 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 to make, you know, to, so we can utilize a smaller generator. And out there, we don't need the sound attenuation that we need here at the municipal office. And that was a big part of the cost was the actual, the sound enclosure over the, uh, the generator, which was quite expensive. So the airport, because of the industrial use, it's not as much of a concern. Although there is, we have to keep the noise down as much as we can. So just just to clear, the, the, the generator for the town, for the uh, municipal office and the uh, library is only for the uh, server. Yes. All right, thank you, Captain um, Sandler. Uh, the only question I got is uh, waterfront development. Is that uh, on track now or not now, but it's not gonna require any further money put in by the municipality as of yet? Through you, Mayor Lawrence. Sorry, can you repeat that, Don? Uh, the town waterfront is it uh, on track for tax for money spent on it, and are we going to end up putting more money into it? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, the intent now is to spend what was approved by council last spring for the remainder of the project. Okay. Councilor Cassidy. Uh, nothing further here. Just to clarify the squash court issue is the area that was used for the programming has been used utilized now as part of an like add on to the cardio room. Um, especially with the COVID restrictions now there's there's the spacing out of equipment that rooms needed to to move equipment or keep equipment at a safe distance. So those that squash court converting it's just making it usable space. So Was it, um, I don't think you had a question there. That was a comment, was it? Just a comment. Thank you. Councillor Lego. Um, not sure if I want to bring this up or not. <laughs> um, waterfront development. I have a question for the clerk. Um, after we passed the bylaw to take the money from reserves, I thought, why why are we, for me, the reserves are there for just in case and for other things that come up for different departments. Why, why would we take the MAT money that we're getting and pay, up, pay that back? I'm just wondering if council wants to bring this back to the table. So I know that we're gonna be looking for money, this budget, and I don't know what we're getting in for MAT tax because I haven't seen it in the budget. And I know mm -hmm. that we decided that we would take the MAT tax money to pay back the $600,000 we used from the infrastructure levy to pay for the waterfront development that was a shortfall. I just don't know if we can do that, bring it back to the table to discuss, to not pay that $600,000 back and use the MAT tax money for some of the things that need to get done right away. Well, before I was just, there are motions to reconsider, but I'm, I'm, uh, we need, we can't discuss that tonight. There would need to be a motion. No, no. To but uh, clerk, is there some, I'm not sure, treasurer, clerk, CAO, clarification to uh, Council Nagel's comment? Uh, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna defer it to you, Brian. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, <clears throat> 
um, providing that the funds haven't yet been transferred and spent, uh, then yes, council can uh, relook at um, at how it wishes to fund that six hundred thousand um, uh, dollar contribution. Um, so we could, you know, if there is a desire, you know, through the uh, reconsideration process, as um, as the mayor mentioned, we can look at it uh, at, at it that way. Um, uh, so that that's an option. I would have to defer to the treasurer. Uh, normally, transfers to and from reserves, um, I believe, don't occur until after the project's completed. Um, so I'm not sure if that transfer has happened yet. Uh, I would defer to the treasurer on that. Yeah. So Brian, I don't mind the fact that we transferred the money. It's just the fact that we decided to to use our the mat tax money to pay it back. I just wonder if council has appetite to bring that to the table and not pay that money back and use any of the mat tax money that, I don't, like I said, I have no idea what we're getting from Matt, Matt back. So, so I think, Councilor Lego, that's the kind of discussion I believe and we can't have until there's a motion to reconsider on the table. So okay. I, I think you're asking the question rhetorically, I hope, but we can't yes. get into that discussion, I believe, Clark, without a motion of, to reconsider being put forward and 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 uh, adopted and then it's reconsidered. Clerk, can you help me here? Uh, so you, Mayor Lawrence, you're correct. The uh, the process for reconsideration um, uh, is 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 very similar to what you've outlined. That's correct. So, Councillor Lego, why don't you speak to the clerk and go through that process? And if you want to bring it back as a motion to reconsider, go through the, go through the process and bring it to the council table as once you. You look into it and you, you figure that's uh, a good recommendation. Do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not trying to clamp you down. I'm trying to stick within the borders of our. our... Yes, sir. I understand. Uh, yes. And that was. Uh, I think we were still on facilities, and you came up. That was your. Yeah. Anything else, Councillor Nagel? Uh, no. I will talk to the clerk. Okay. No. Thank you. So back to you, Treasurer. Thank you. Now moving into still sticking with facilities in regards to uh, capital projects, they are requesting uh, new capital projects to be placed into the 2021 uh, budget. Council has received justification and information on all 12 of these projects. My question to Council is, do you have any questions? So these are the questions that are on the blue spread, uh, highlighted in, in blue, the projects under, under facilities starting with four and ending with 15. Correct. And there's, there's maybe 45 minutes left in my gas tank. I, I'm not sure if we're going to, I guess we can wade into this, but it uh, seems ambitious. Let's, let's just get started. Uh, Councillor Howie, and we're looking at the, the projects as described. Councillor Howie. Yes, uh, thank you. So my, my question, with the office curbing, uh, is that price uh, developed through an outside contractor uh, running that project or, or would that be done in-house um, at $35,000? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, we just used a per meter cost from uh, past projects. Okay, thank you. And regarding the upgrading of the, uh, the, the fireproofing repair to the fitness center at $60,000, is that uh, to be with any kind of code to protect the, the steel? Um, is it deteriorating outside of code? Um, uh, three mayor Lawrence. Yeah, the code requires that the exposed steel either it's going to be covered with like a drywall bulkhead or some sort of paint on fireproofing. Uh, so large lots of areas of it have been deteriorating and it's also something that was noted in the condition assessment of the building. So it's, uh, you know, we may look at repairing just repairing the damaged spots if we can. And that could reduce the cost by quite a bit. We're also looking at an opportunity, an option to paint it with uh, an intumescent paint that could uh, provide the same kind of protection and look a lot nicer and not fall apart as as readily as this this type of fireproofing does. 
Okay, so this this projected cost is to replace the entire uh, roof. Yes, three mail so That was the estimated cost in the condition assessment report. Okay, thank you. And regarding the uh, men's uh, shower in the fitness center um, to put up uh, walls and uh, handles, could we instead just look at putting up uh, handles to to improve accessibility? Um, understanding if we do this in the in the fitness center showers, uh, then the, the same could be done also in the change rooms uh, along the dressing rooms. Uh, three Mary Lawrence, yes, that could be an option just to provide uh, a better kind of uh, handicap stall, I guess, or space in the in the entire shower. Okay. And uh, regarding the, the air purification system uh, for the, the fitness center, would that strictly be for the uh, gymnasium uh, cardio rooms and the weight room, or are we looking at um, expanding that into the, the common spaces as well? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, I've looked at kind of a, not portable per se, but uh, kind of a hanging air purification system. And we could possibly put one in each space, depending on how big the gym one needs to be. Okay, thank you. And the, Fire hall security measures. Um, I understand those are, I mean, they're already in place in the Sioux Lookout uh, Fire Department. So would that be using a, a similar um, system? Uh, three Mayor Lawrence, I believe so. And to speak to that, Bob actually recently got a quote for the work to be done out in Hudson and it's only $4,000. So that's quite a bit less than I had anticipated for what the request was. Okay. Thank you. And the, the public works fence, understanding that um, the yard is largely unsecured, uh, this would include, um, and, and from the image, two gates on either side and not um, securing around the, the entire perimeter at the back of the yard? This uh, would be main yeah, sorry. No, yeah, it would just be the gates and uh, and yeah, I think around the, the perimeter, there's lots of forested area, so access is would be difficult. Okay, so this would be to primarily control any kind of vehicle traffic uh, in and out. Okay. Yes. And my my last question uh, is regarding the HVAC review for the Centennial Center. Understanding that there are some uh, issues in with the system and difficulties bringing in a technician from um, our, well, given our, our area here in Sulaco. So is this cost. Uh, primarily broken down to bringing in a technician, accommodating them, and, and that, or um, I'll, I'll let you take that. Uh, three Mayor Lawrence, yeah, it's it's the, it's a large building with a pretty extensive uh, uh, heating cooling system. So just it's you know uh, uh, we wouldn't likely be going to our current uh, maintenance provider for this. It would be more of a higher level kind of consulting firm to go through the system and see if we can hopefully utilize what we have, although that's gonna probably likely prove to be difficult. Uh, just, yeah, just to provide some options on how we need to move forward. I mean, unfortunately, this year was kind of the worst year yet. Uh, we spent uh, close to $30,000 this year just in repairs uh, and getting parts and pieces for this system that's only 10 years old is proving extremely difficult. So we need to, uh, we need to kind of plan for the future here. Okay, and understanding there's tenants in the facility, um, has, has their feedback been that uh, the system needs repairs or have there been a deal of complaints from from that body? Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, yes, we've been dealing with concerns and complaints. And like I say, this year was especially tough because just trying to, well, with COVID and just trying to get people here and again, just trying to like the parts like this compressor that we needed took several months to get. And it's because they can't just buy a new one. We have to find one that's compatible with the system. Okay, thank you. Councilor Tenson. I, I think that uh, for, to me, they're all fairly clear. Um, 
I think though we we should be looking at how we're going to reduce some of the costs because uh, it's an, a lot of money going into the recreation center. I think we need to have a discussion of just how much we should be putting into the recreation center and um, asking questions. Do we really need the public works fence? Questions like that. I think there's going to have to be some real hard talk about it. Safety, yes, we need safety measures. Um, we need to make sure things uh, are serviced now so they don't cost us more later. But I think we need to be discussing this in more, a lot of this stuff in more detail. That's all I have to say. Councillor Bath. Yeah, I kind of agree. There's a few things on here I would probably pull off right away, particularly because they're all in the tax levy. Um, I, I'm concerned about the Centennial HVAC review, and I've actually spoken to Jody about that one. That's uh, there; those systems, that type of system, is always going to need re, uh, um, technicians to be coming from somewhere else, and probably Winnipeg. There's nobody in the area that serves as these kind of these kind of systems, and it, it's uh, they're they're great systems, but it, they're once they start to act up, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. So we either have to find a system that's that's newer when we put them in, or at least where we have technicians that are available can, then can and can come and service them. Uh, I'm pre I'm pretty concerned. Like when when they come to look at it, I'm quite sure they're going to say you need to replace it, and we're probably going to be looking at two couple of hundred thousand dollars. So I think we need that's 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 an issue I'm really concerned about with that one. Some of the other things I think we need to just pull out, like municipal office curbing, I'm quite sure we don't need it this year. And uh, like our councillor Timson uh, said, maybe we don't need the public works fence this year, although I do agree it's very open in there. Anybody can drive in and do whatever they like practically. So we, at some time we have to have another discussion about these items to either leave them on or take them off. Councillor Fenlon. Yes, um, I'd like to speak to seven and eight, which regards Hudson. Um, uh, security measures, it's, it's time to put um, better locking systems on the doors and stuff like that. And so we can track who's coming and going. And uh, the furnaces in the fire hall, been, this is the third year that we've had trouble with two of them. Um, and they're 1985, no, no, I want to say 1984, uh, built furnaces at the time and they're starting to fail and it's hard finding uh, parts for them at this time. Okay, that's good. Councilor Cassidy. Yeah, no, I, I got uh, similar comments to Councillor Timpson and Councillor Bath too. I, I think there are, I, I do have some concerns with the amount of, of projects just coming out of taxation this year. I think we need to kind of hammer down on what our needs are this year, especially with some of the challenges going forward. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Bath with the HVAC system. I know the Centennial Center is does actually make us some money so we do need to look at that but my question is is it better to just look at outright replacement have people tender them out and come in and give us suggestions through a tender through tendering out just for replacement of it and working with what we have versus bring a consultant in and tell us what we need and then we have to tender out to a new um just my thoughts i don't know the, the inner workings of that but i'd rather if it's going to be a couple hundred thousand well we're we're a third of the way there um, with just that consulting fees there. So um, stuff like that. And, and I know we kind of eased up on the rec center last year with the budgeting. Um, I, I understand that. Um, and I, that's probably why we see a bit more stuff coming now. Um, but I guess like some of the stuff with how much use, it's getting a fair bit of use now, but if things change and you know, the showers aren't really going can we hold off um just a couple of those things on what we can look at a little harder and maybe push back a year so that's my thoughts 
Uh, yeah. Uh, again, agreeing with Councillor Cassidy and Bath and Timpson. Um, specifically, Centennial Center HVAC. Uh, we are making some money on that building. Again, I would probably prefer if it's if it's going to be failing all the time and we're just getting people coming in and paying and paying consultants to give us an opinion, it might be best to look at getting a price for a new one and using the money that we make from that building for rentals to pay for pay for the HVAC, a brand new HVAC system. Um, what else? Yeah, we're going to have to go through everything. There's only limited amount of dollars available and According to my calculations, we're already at 3.7% increase to the to the taxpayers with all the capital and what's left for operational and the plus the 31,000 for insurance. So we need to uh, figure this all out and sit down and hammer out each one of these and see what's needed and what's not needed and what we can defer for another year and what we can get away with and hope Hopefully it's going to be a positive for 2021 and uh, we can look to a, a bit better 2022, but uh, I think 2021 is going to be a very difficult year. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, Treasurer, it's back to you now. So, uh, for the next section. Thank you. Moving forward to the Public Works Department. So uh, these are the 2021, 2020 capital projects that are being brought forward. We have a total of five projects that are being brought forward um, uh, that have already been approved uh, by council with um, descriptions on each capital project as to what exactly is going on. Does council have any questions in regards to the projects that are being brought forward? So this is the public works 19 through 23, the green, the green sheet, the green uh, highlighted area. Councilor that, Howard. That is correct. I do not have any questions. Councilor Timpson. Um, no, not at this time. Thank you. Councilor Bath. Yeah, the only question probably is regarding the uh, water intake inspections that we put the same pr price from uh, from 20 to 21, and I'm curious if we're going to be able to hold that price. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, uh, Northern Waterworks says, uh, I've spoken to this on a couple of occasions with them, um, as they're the ones that would take on this work on our behalf. And uh, apparently the, he's bought his own camera now, submersible type camera that he's thinking uh, would suffice for this type of inspection. So therefore I haven't made any adjustments to the cost that was presented. Uh, I believe this may even be carry, being carried forward now from 2019. So um, it's something that Northern Waterworks is deemed is warranted. However, uh, due to circumstances or having trouble getting it accomplished. Yeah. Uh, no comment on. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, nothing here, thanks. Councillor Legal. No, I'm good with this. Back to you, Treasurer. Thank you. Now moving forward into 2021 new capital projects. So before I ask council if we have any, if they have any questions, there's a couple of um, new ways that we decided to approach these projects uh, in 2021. As you can see in the, the estimated project budget line, it shows what we estimated the project, the total project may be. And then in the 2020 uh, project budget line is what we're going to expense uh, in 2020. The reason that we're showing it this way is because we wanted to make council aware that these projects um, have been looked at very carefully with uh, public works. We've also applied for funding um, for one of these projects, which we have been denied with but um, we do want to make you aware that um, the projects will need to move forward 
So by showing you what we're estimating right now the project cost may be, we wanted to bring that to light now instead of later on um, after the design phase was uh, completed. So that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Anne. I'm going to pass it over to Council to ask any questions in regards to these projects. So to be clear, this is Public Works Utilities on the new capital project summary, summary item 16 to 24. Correct. Sorry, I'm looking at the, the hard copy. It's easier for me to see than your sheet. That's why I'm giving those numbers. Some others might be too. Councillor Howie. I don't have any questions uh, for me. Thank you. Councillor Jensen. Yeah, um, the blue the blue column that's the total that's going to be the total cost over several years, and the brownish is what we're going to be putting in it this year, correct? Correct. Um, and um, so you know, we've got projects worth three million dollars, uh, you know, five million, two million. Have they all been approved or no? Yeah, it's just a, anyhow, yeah. So these are long-term, we're looking at long-term projects that we have to do basically, right? At this time, correct. We are looking at funding in regards to these projects to help lower our costs um, for them. Um, we do get federal gas tax every year. I'm working with the government to see how long we can hold on to that money over a couple of years to help uh, with a large, um, well, somewhat large um, payment that we could do on these projects. We're, we want you to know that these projects are very important and that we wanted to bring to light um, what the total project cost estimates would be on these projects. And basically they're all things that have to be done. We don't, they're not optional, like new showers or stuff. They're, they really have to be done. I think it's what mm -hmm. you're saying. Explain more if you had a particular project that you wanted verification on. Could you repeat that, Carly? I couldn't hear it too well. Oh, sorry. Andrew can explain if you had more questions on a specific project uh -huh. for the cost and everything else and why it needs to be done. Andrew would be able to explain in more detail than what's explained okay. on the justification sheets. Okay, thank you. So your uh, your audio was breaking up there, Councillor Timpson. Was it was that all? Uh, yes, yes, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Bath. So the uh, obviously the big question is on the, the two million dollar uh, one in long term debt. Is that the one that our funding has been denied on? That's my first question. Um, through you, Mayor Lawrence, um, I'll answer that. I'm not too sure who it was directed to, but no, the answer to that is no. Uh, we we applied for uh, ICIP uh, funding, Green Stream funding, for the uh, $5 million project of expanding our wastewater treatment plant. That's what was uh, denied funding. The 8th Avenue infrastructure upgrade project, um, the design uh, for that uh, avenue, as well as 3rd Avenue, was approved by council in 2019. So we've gone out and got designs done for these two uh, infrastructure projects within the municipality and the design is done. And therefore we're looking now to move one of them forward uh, into construction. The 8th Avenue, in my opinion, would uh, probably be deemed uh, more warranted than the 3rd Avenue one. Um, at, just ma mainly because of the the state of the road on 8th Avenue from Front Street to Prince Street is uh, is in critical condition. It's uh, it's very uh, it requires uh, resurfacing uh, now or probably a couple of years ago actually. But anyway, the drainage would be dealt with there, and then 
after we had the water distribution uh, system analysis done, it was deemed that there's some uh, lack of fire flows in the west end of town. And uh, so therefore uh, installing some water main under 8th Avenue to join King Street water main to Queen and then Queen to Prince would uh, give us some fire flows that are required for the west end of town. So um, th this project is, um, is essentially being brought forward, uh, not to get too off topic here, but, uh, and it's really not public knowledge yet. There was supposed to be a report coming to council on this, but the, the Wellington and First Avenue intersection project would have been scheduled for construction this summer. It is now postponed uh, due to uh, an issue with uh, not having a detour available. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to get into that right now. I can elaborate if, if it's uh, asked. But uh, that project is now delayed. So the original schedule for that project would have been constructed this summer. It was all planned out until about a month ago when we received some news that uh, we didn't have an avail the availability to use uh, Highway 72 or Ed, Ed Ariano Bypass as a detour. So in, in lieu of not having a major infrastructure project this year, um, this is being brought forward and presented to council at this time so that we can move forward with uh, infrastructure replacements that's needed and not have a leg of a year where, where nothing's being done. And uh, essentially that's that's why this project is being presented now. Okay, my, my other question is just in the, in the 2021 project around the Brown Line, um, there's a, a lot of smaller numbers. Uh, some of you said have already been done. I, I'm assuming those are design numbers for the, for the actual project, is that correct? I, I'm certainly I'm in favor of doing the designs and having them in the drawer. I'm just curious if that's what that is. Uh, th through you, Mayor Lawrence, you are correct. Uh, wastewater treatment plant expansion would be to initiate the design to get a consultant to to initiate that. So it's uh, essentially shovel ready um, for 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 when we look at that here in the near future. Uh, Third Avenue and Front Street intersection upgrade the same. Uh, we applied for funding for that uh, about two years ago through. Uh, OCIP, which um, the, the when the provincial government switched there uh, with to Ford government, um, that funding was pulled. So that project was uh, pulled off the funding application. Uh, having obtained uh, some sewer video of that trunk uh, that goes through CN property in part of Front Street, uh, we had a contractor in this summer from Winnipeg, Unijet. They flushed the sewer and provided some camera inspection, uh, initial review of that first leg on Front Street. Uh, requires some uh, some change some it requires to be replaced uh, in in due time let's I'll just leave it at that uh, we need to move forward so initiating the design for that will get us in place to replace the trunk sewer as well as upgrades uh, part of the corridor arterial route there third avenue corner of front street I don't think uh, I have to say much about the state of the surface road surface there and the lack of drainage in that part of town so the Pelican Park lift station, same thing, uh, went uh, to a consultant and uh, asked them to do an assessment on it based on the fact that there's uh, the development south of the highway, hotels, uh, m and fire base now, uh, potential for other development, and it's deemed that that lift station does not have the capacity for what's behind it. Uh, it essentially was constructed for what we call the Pelican Park subdivision there, the Forest Inn and Mitchell Drive in that area. So. Um, we're going to get a design done there to what's required in the lift station in terms of pump upgrades and look at tw twinning the force main underneath Pelican Lake. Um, and same with the northeastern water main revisions. We have some water main there that's redundant now with the removal of Pine Tree Trailer Park years ago. It's still in service. It doesn't serve anything other than providing a loop, but it continue is continually breaking on us. So a little bit of investment there would uh, save us some headache and move forward. Um, and the other ones there are, uh, are the other six through eight, nine, they're, they're not any designs. They're, they're hard. So lift station and communication upgrades to cellular and, uh, Doc Moverly is a request from NWI for, for some, uh, enhancement of the operation of that facility. The wastewater treatment plant cleaning inspection is done every five years. It was done five years ago by NWI under the previous contract at no cost. Uh, this contract, they pulled that as a, as a, a service that was provided on the contract. So there's an additional expense there, but it needs to be done. And uh, the sludge trailer, uh, uh, unfortunately about four years uh, in use from a new one and uh, it's it's done. It's a very corrosive environment there and uh, we need to upgrade that to continue to move sludge from the sewage treatment plant to the landfill. 
Okay, thanks, Andrew. That answered them all. Sounds like they are, should all be going ahead. Dr. Fallon. Uh, I have no comment there. Uh, a lot of the discussion answered my questions. Thank you. Dr. Cassidy. So essentially with that, uh, the funding you talked about, Andrew, that uh, the, the provincial government pulled, there's really not a lot of options for us with our, our infrastructure and whatnot for funding opportunities anymore. Through, through you, Mayor Lawrence, not, not at this time. The most recent uh, was the ICIP. And, uh, but as far as I know, the OCIP, which was um, a, a regular source for us in terms of uh, funding for some projects, uh, I don't think it's going to be reintroduced to the best of my knowledge as long as the Ford government is in. So there is really essentially, you're correct, it's, there's not a lot of funding out there uh, in terms of replacing infrastructure. And in my opinion, we have to move forward if we continually wait to fund these projects through government funding, we're going to end up in such a lag in, in 10 to 20 years. I think we're going to be in a situation where we may have uh, trouble providing service if we don't uh, do some proactive uh, work here right now. I, I, I definitely I understand that and appreciate it. And, and I believe having 80 year old infrastructure under some of that, I think 1940s, you said some of that with the, the Third Avenue, it just, it's, 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 uh, it's unsettling that there isn't more out there for for municipalities to access, definitely. Uh, um, one way to, to address that is uh, with the current legislation for our asset management throughout the years here, as it progresses into the stages that we have to meet, the end product is a financial plan that um, has to meet, meet your shortfalls. So, uh, once we have condition assessments done and everything, if it says, okay, we're, we're, we're $25 million short right now of work that needs to be done now, a component of that is where is your funding shortfall coming from? So uh, at that time, it's going to be addressed even further. So yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so the Wellington projects on, on hold. Uh, through you, Mayor Lawrence, I, I there was a report coming forward. I've, I've prepared a draft report. I've, I've since sent it to the CAO. Um, I guess we can talk further about it here. Um, I know time is of the essence here, but MTO presented a project a couple of years ago whereby they needed to re rehabilitate what they refer to as the CN overhead, which is the bypass on Ed Ariano bypass, the bridge over the rails. And uh, once we received notification of funding from ICIP, I reached out to MTO and asked them what their plan schedule was for that work so that it wouldn't interfere with us because obviously we, we, we require that route for a bypass of First Avenue and Wellington Street. We can't construct what we're planning to construct without a full detour of the site. It's the, the, the other road infrastructure in the vicinity of it doesn't facilitate a detour. So um, here we are in November and uh, after reaching out to MTO a couple times within a year and no response, um, all of a sudden a circulation is received asking for comments on the, the project being scheduled for this summer. So <laughs> off went a, uh, an email fairly extensive to, to MTO asking them uh, why the project was being scheduled when we inquired before about the schedule not interfere with ours and uh, the answer we essentially got back was their engineers have determined that that rehabilitation of that overhead cannot be delayed uh, with the current state and uh, therefore they asked if we would um, consider or it was it possible for us to delay our project for a year which it is uh, because the funding allows for such a delay it's just another year where, where that intersection is going to be in the state it is now however um, I talked to the design consultant of the Wellington Street and First Avenue project as well on this and, and knowing what was incurred when we reconstructed Wellington Street from Government Road to the underpass where we had the bypass as a full detour, even then with it functioning at 100% capacity, there was issues with traffic and the public was not impressed. There was many requests for street lights at the intersection, so on and so forth, and you know a, lo a lot of public outcry. So... <laughs> it's not even worth considering trying to do the same when the CN overhead is reduced to one lane and has traffic lights. I mean, it, it just can't yeah. work. So, uh, so okay. here we are. Uh, and then, so because of that, 
to move forward, not to reiterate, um, we're presenting the 8th Avenue project for your consideration so we can move forward with, uh, with that with with something budget this summer and, and move forward with infrastructure replacement. Yeah. And then uh, 2022, uh, the Wellington First Avenue project uh, would be constructed, the intersection. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, Carly, would we build? I, I, I'm sure we don't know what the interests would be on all those this this type of long term debt, but um, I don't know if we can get some sort of projection. I don't know how long of a term this this kind of project, two point three million, would we would be borrowing money for for what period of time? And I don't know if we can get for the next meetings sort of an an outlay of you know, per year, this is what we're, we're looking at paying each year for the next 15 years or whatever it's gonna be. Just so we have an idea. I can put some numbers together for you for the next budget meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So treasurer, um, what's, what's your next section? Is it reserved or? The next section is uh, recre the recreation department. What they have is they just have one budget that's uh, one capital project that's being brought forward into 2021. They didn't get it uh, finished and uh, we'll be completing it in, in 2021. After that. Yeah, fine, that, that's good. Uh, that's the on the I'm sorry I missed that one. Planning 24 on the green the green column sheet, which is really part of the waterfront development project that we decided to do ourselves as opposed to put on the contract. Uh, Correct. This is just a summary sheet of all of our 2021 capital projects. This includes both sheets. The 2020 projects that are being brought forward and the current 2021 uh, projects, if council were to approve uh, all the projects that are currently on the table. Um, we're looking at uh, just a slight over of 2.6 million in funding that we'll be receiving. We're looking at transferring out $1.4 million from reserves. Uh, just over $4 million of long-term debt. So this long-term debt would be applied for in 2022 and would be placed on the books for 2022. Uh, we would be uh, taking out uh, almost $600,000 from AIF. We're transferring over from taxation dollars in 2020 that's already been assigned for these projects out of taxation, 12, um, $12,000 out of that. And um, the current tax levy for capital projects is $331,500 with all projects currently on the table. So I just, it's just a summary to give uh, council an idea of where everything is uh, currently sitting. And you could distribute that to council after? Pardon? I didn't see that in I didn't see that in the uh, will you distribute that distribute that to council? Yeah, I can after the meeting. So I'm I'm going to uh, I know that uh, where's the clerk? Have you disappeared? I'm here, Mayor Lawrence. Oh, thanks. Um, you're going to give me the the wicked eye pretty soon about the ten o'clock limit. Right. Uh, I don't, um, I think we've almost gone as far as we can go tonight. I think, do you have one last, is that reserves that you have uh, currently? There's, I can skip through reserves because everyone has a copy of the full reserve breakdown within their budget. There is one thing that I want to stress to council before we leave tonight. Can is I? One thing you want to stress to council? Okay. Yes. Uh, is that okay? Why don't you go ahead and yeah, and I'm thinking the reserves. We're going to have another budget meeting, uh, um, so you can do you can go through the reserves uh, in a little bit more detail at that time. You can skip it tonight, but if you want to stress something now, please go ahead. So um, I'm targeting uh, finishing treasurer. I'm targeting finishing at, at ten o'clock uh, with a summation to 
and direction to, to staff. Well, Go ahead. I promise to speak very quickly. One thing that isn't included in, in tonight's uh, operating budget is Friends of Cedar Bay has requested a uh, funding request of $3,000 to help with their liability insurance. So that is not part of our current operating that would be above for a taxation increase. All right, thank you. The biggest thing that I want to stress to Council is this. In 2021, MPAC assessment will not be uh, increased. So usually every year, houses uh, either increase or de decrease due to MPAC's assessments. MPAC has notified the municipality that the 2020 assessments will remain the same into 2021. The only changes that are going to occur are be the ones that for any supplementary bills that have occurred within the municipality that will be added on to the taxation uh, into 2021. So when you look at the tax levy, you'll see that there's a little bit of an increase of somewhere around just over $70,000 that is due to assessment changes because of supplemental bills that have occurred due to buildings and everything else that were assessed this year. This is huge for our municipality with the fact that assessments are not changing. Every year the municipality brings in anywhere from 350 to $400,000 extra in taxation revenue due to assessment changes alone. We are not receiving that this year. So I feel that the management team has done their due diligence very carefully with putting this budget together for you with the fact that everybody knew that we would not be receiving that extra revenue this year, specifically from taxation. I want to stress to MPAC has not also not indicated to municipalities when that assessment change will occur. Will it be doubled in 2022, meaning the 2021 assessment change and the 2022 assessment change would be combined together? We don't know that and they haven't said anything as to when they will have an answer to that. So I really want to stress to Council that this is not occurring this year for municipalities across the board and that the staff has done their due diligence to put this budget together as close as possible as they could to the 2020 um, budget. So that being said, I'm speaking fast. We are requesting a 3.5% tax levy increase. We roughly need $65,000. However, that might, number has changed due to insurance um, numbers coming in this morning. Uh, 331 is coming from capital projects, making the total that amount for a taxation uh, levy increase. So that is really what I wanted to stress to council tonight at the end of all of this is that the that assessment is not occurring and that's what's making it very difficult this year for uh, staff to put their budget together. And I feel that everyone has done a magnificent job with trying to get it as close as possible to the 2020 budget without any sort of a huge uh, taxation increase. And I'm done. Thank you, Treasurer. I, I think yeah, I commend staff for, for the work they've done. And absolutely, um, I think you, you you summed it up, and, and I think council could echo that. Uh, however, I'm uh, as I'm not going to uh, to take the discussion further tonight to, into that that uh, detail of, of uh, assessing that or the the uh, the details any further. Sorry, I'm going to run out of gas real soon. Um, my proposal is uh, to council uh, for direction of staff and. And I apologize, staff. You may have wanted us to, to tell you fine, approve the budget or 2.8 or whatever it is that's not going to happen tonight. Um, I think uh, personally, I need more time to look through the capital project for sure, um, and uh, and I suspect council does too. I'm going to suggest council that uh, we direct uh, staff 
to schedule a second budget meeting in probably would be early January at this time. I'm, I'm thinking staff can come back and say, no, there are available dates in December, but I, I kind of think we're getting kind of close to Christmas and we already have two council meetings next week. And after that, we were pretty close, but that will be staff's decision uh, and, and whether or not they get a, a, a council turnout. And that when we come back, um, that the uh, council would have decisions on, on several items to make after some presentation by staff. I think the capital uh, project, uh, the can't remember the, name of the green sheets or the blue sheets are obviously the ones where there's going to be a considerable discussion as there has been in previous years. And that's where the majority of the, the taxation increase is, is coming at 331,500. So that's where decisions uh, need to be made, uh, I think. Uh, so staff may want to look at prioritizing those internally in each department, prioritize what you think are the most important ones. I think also look at some of those projects in terms of is there possibilities to put some into uh, short and long term debt versus uh, versus all in the taxation year. Uh, possibility is the first one. Um, the 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 other thing is reserves. You could go through the reserves at the uh, for us. Just take the the time that you might have taken tonight to do that. I think there's some op uh, some opportunities in the operational budget, small, uh, but uh, the, uh, the council itself has uh, suggested maybe there's some more cutting it in council travel budgets. Uh, some councillors have suggested uh, cutting council wages. Uh, you may pull council and, and see further on the travel and, and council wage, their wage. Um, personally, I don't do this for the money, but I wouldn't do it without the money. I'll just put it that way. Sorry, folks. Um, but at poll the council. Um, I think uh, you have the insurance hit that you just found out about today that will need to be incorporated. Uh, and I'm not suggesting you redo the budget. I'm suggesting you come back with some of uh, the impacts in this era. UCAP is obviously the, the big ticket and Friends of Cedar Bay, that request will need to be, uh, I think, voted on as well. I'm going to ask council uh, if, if I, I'm, I'm not willing to take this further tonight. I think we have a uh, probably two hours of discussion that it needs to be with fresh fresh minds. Um, CAO, reaction? Um, it's through you, Mayor Lawrence, if you're finished. I just have to, I'd just like to say a few uh, parting comments. Parting comments, okay. Is that like the ones that we couldn't hear that were said by <laughs> somebody else? No, no. Please go ahead. Um, we just want to um, thank Council for the opportunity to present the budget tonight. Um, it's a uh, um, a little different this year because of, of COVID and it had to be done virtually. Um, so what we're asking, uh, staff is asking is if council has any further questions or comments or, or, or suggestions following this meeting after you've had uh, more time to review the uh, documents that uh, we have presented this evening to please send them directly to uh, Carly and uh, via email and um, also to the public who's watching this evening. You have the opportunity as well, and we apologize we couldn't uh, do this uh, deliberation in public, but you have the opportunity to give us your questions, comments, or suggestions uh, as well. If you email budget2021 at suelookout.ca, or mail it to the municipality uh, stating attention budget 2021 so that we do not miss your uh, comments or suggestions. And um, we've also posted that information for the public on our website, Facebook and, uh, and um, various means uh, if through a media release. So it's on our Facebook page right now. So I just wanted to give that uh, information to the public so they have it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I'll just go around the council table for very quick comments uh, before we close off. Councillor Howie. No, I, I think that staff um, we provided as much direct as with the limited time frame. And I do look forward to in January. Uh, understanding, of course, this, um, this is the first budget and, and it usually changes quite a bit um, come the time of passing. I, I look forward to next meeting and providing my, my comments in the time between and any uh, public input um, is always an asset and of course reach out to me 
or I'm sure any of the other counselors or through the, the email that uh, the CAO mentioned. Thank you. Councilor Simpson. Oh, thank you, staff. You've done a really good job. Um, it, it, it's hard to it's hard to uh, make too many comments just yet. I, I do think, in terms of our capital, um, we have to be really serious about uh, projects such as Eighth Avenue and Third in Front, where if we don't fix that stuff soon. Um, we're, we will regret it later on. And, uh, you know, there's some things that are lovely to have, like the curb, the curb around the municipal office, but we, I'd rather have pipes that are working well than a parking lot that looks nice. So it, that's the kind of thinking I'm, that's, that's what, how my thinking is going uh, tonight in this. So that's about all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Yeah, thanks, Steph, for that. That was a very, uh, a very organized budget to look at, and uh, I appreciate the problems you've gone through with COVID and whatnot. So, it's going to be interesting looking at it, and I'm sure we're we'll making some changes. See you later, Councillor Fallon. Uh, that was a good, good question and answer session for just about everything that we went through there. And looking at 3.5% looks like a lot, but hopefully we can work at it and come up with someone, come up with something on the end there. That's good. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you, staff. I, I did think that the, pro, or the, the budget was very well presented, very well organized. So commend you for that and I, I do appreciate the, the pressure you're under with regards to the impact assessments not coming through so I, I think you've done a good job and we'll we'll have a few more comments going forward and work at it that way so thank you very much everyone again uh, reiterate what every other councillor said and the mayor thank you very much for your time and effort um I know this is difficult it's a it's it's just an added thing to this difficult year that we're going through. So we'll work, work through it together and we'll come up to, with some compromise and figure it all out. And uh, hopefully for the best for the uh, residents of our community. So thank you very much. Thanks council. I will just say thank you very much staff. Uh, Treasurer, great job. First budget and all managers. Great work. Thank you very much. I need a confirmatory motion for uh, the bylaw number 8920, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of Sulacoat, December 10th, 2020, special meeting be read first, second, third time, and passed. Moved by Councillor Bath, seconded by Councillor Fanlin. All in favor? Yep. Carry. And Mr. Clerk, do I need a motion to adjourn? You do not, Mayor Lawrence. Well, wow, we it just fizzles out just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good. We'll see you next good week. Night, good, night. Good, night. Good, night. good night, everybody. Good night.